I think we're on. Oh my <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Welcome to the Daily Wire Backstage Spring Break Edition. Unlike Girls Gone Wild, Spring Break we have... I can't even read that. <laughs> I got the Girls Gone Wild in the whole show so far. <laughs> so far, this is great, dude. I like Girls Gone Wild. You just start drooling. <laughs> Roll opening graphic. So that's why you always do a test uh, of reading the teleprompter <laughs> before the show, which we definitely What if you do. hosted a show, dude? Yeah, that, that's what, what I did. Yeah, like you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Twitter thinks it'd be a great idea. Yeah. Twitter couldn't possibly be <laughs> <laughs> I am Jeremy Boring, God King of the Daily Wire, lowercase g, lowercase k. With me tonight, Ben Shapiro, Andrew Clavin, eh. Alicia Krauss, <laughs> the only married pregnant mother ever to appear in a spring break edition of anything. <laughs> and we have a special guest tonight. He is perhaps even grumpier than Ben about needing to be, uh, nah, 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 nah. and he does his show from a car. <laughs> you, you guys know this guy? Yeah, yeah, he works here. Matt <laughs> really? Walsh. Wow. Yeah, Matt oh, Walsh. Wow. Is he, he's, that, he's that well-known Buddhist? Is that, yeah, yeah, is that yeah. the well-known yoga, 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 yoga Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. We're going to do something really cool tonight, so pay attention. If you sign up to become a Daily Wire annual subscriber during the live broadcast of this episode, you and a guest will be entered into a raffle to win, get this, a free trip to L.A., and an opportunity to sit in on the set and watch us as we tape The Daily Wire backstage. You'll get to meet all of us after the show, except for Matt Walsh, because let's be honest, he doesn't want to meet you. <laughs> and, and also, we'll probably never see him again. <laughs> in fact, tonight, right now, we have the winners uh, the, who, who won the raffle last time we did a Daily Wire backstage. They're sitting in on our smoke-filled set just off camera. Uh, they subscribed during the live stream last time we were together and won the sweepstakes. And here he is with his wife. Thank you guys for joining us uh, tonight. Well, now you can never get a job anywhere, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you two could uh, win a chance to look as miserable as they do right now <laughs> by becoming a Daily Wire annual subscriber during tonight's live stream. Subscribers also get to ask questions during the show. Alicia, let them know how. Yeah, uh, you know, I once worked for a really generous boss who gave my husband and I a pretty hefty check that helped pay for a lavish honeymoon in, on the beaches of Australia. So when I heard the spring break edition and the God King said I would get to go to a beach, I thought it would be better than a green screen. Uh, anyway. Alicia, you're not supposed to ruin the joke. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some of our best special effects. <laughs> that we've ever done. I don't know. The special effect of Matt Walsh in a Hawaiian shirt is pretty good. <laughs> Maybe you spent everything trying to convince him to get here, and that's why I'm not actually on a beach in Oahu. But... He drove here in his studio. <laughs> All the way from the East Coast. I'm glad I couldn't make it across country. That's a lot for that car. Uh, so, yes. We should sign up tonight. Oh, sorry, the beach is so loud. Excuse me a moment. <laughs> hey, you should sign up to be a Daily Wire subscriber tonight because not only do you get to submit your questions, you could have the chance to win to sit in on that awful smoke-filled room. I mean, I feel really bad being a married mom of three. Like, they're married and have two kids at home, and this is their idea of a date night. We should really do better, guys. <laughs> so go over to dailywire.com. If you're a subscriber, be sure to ch type your question into the Daily Wire chat box so you can have it read and answered on the air. And, I mean, if you thought that March Madness was all about college basketball, which is something I just learned last year is the reigning Daily Wire March wait, Madness wait, 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 bracket wait. champ. Did you just say that March Madness is about college basketball? <laughs> I've been wondering that for three <laughs> weeks. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more just angry that she won the pool last year, Alicia. I'm just reminding everyone because I know terrible. I'm not going to win again this year. But March Madness, I think, also stands for politics this week because mm. this week, the greatest news week ever... You can go over here, to our here. Facebook poll and check out and vote what do you think the best story is of this greatest news week ever. A, the Mueller report destroys the Russian hoax, uh, the Russian collusion hoax. Michael's super duper excited about that one. B, not a single Senate Democrat votes for the Green New Deal. C, Jesse Smollett gets off scot-free. <laughs> or D, the economist apologizing for calling Ben an alt-writer. <laughs> well... That sounds great. That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> Can we go? By the way, I think that the poll tonight is just an outline of tonight's show. <laughs> I'm glad that we finally organized this yeah. thing. It's basically what there is to talk about is the greatest news week in the greatest history of so, I do. I do have to point out that our definition of great conservative news weeks has radically changed because it used to be that a great conservative news week was like, you know, appointing a Supreme Court justice or 
Tearing down the Berlin Wall. And now, it's, right, great conservative, winning World War II, like great, great conservative <laughs> Newsweeks. Now it's like, the, the president is not a Russian cat's paw. <laughs> Take that, leftist. The thing is, <laughs> wait it. The, the reason it's the greatest Newsweek is, obvi- I mean, it's not, we're saying, okay, good, the president's not a stooge of Russia. That's great. It's the fact that a, a narrative that the leftist yeah, told us is for over two years was not just 40% wrong, was not just... 60%. It was 175,000 million percent wrong. That's Yale math right there. That's Yale math right there for you. It was, and it was, it was just the perfect victory. I think it deserves a, a bigger drink than we're used to drinking around here. You should talk about that whiskey, by the way. Yes. Did you see what it is? This so look whiskey, at the label of it. If you just... It says it's the Republicans pounce whiskey. I love That's it. right, Republicans pounce. That's what it is. Pounce because Republicans whiskey. Have pounce. It's a little picture of you. On it's a, a, a little tiger, Shapiro a riding a tiger and pouncing. And it how says on the very bottom. How did they get that picture of you on the tiger? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a live action photo. Uh, and then it says on the bottom, in case of indictment, break seal and pour over email servers. <laughs> it does say that right on the bottom. <laughs> Pretty fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, now the, the, the media fail here is is the real story, right? The media and the Democratic fail here. The, because all they had to do was just say, President Trump, weird. Right, that's all they had yeah. to do for like the last couple of years. Just yeah. say, this guy, really? Hmm? And yeah. instead it was, no, he works for Vladimir Putin. No, without a doubt, the evidence is gonna come forth. And you have schmucks like Adam Schiff pretending that he has backroom knowledge. My favorite, of course, was John Brennan suggesting for two years on national television that he had secret information that said that Donald Trump was in fact working for Vladimir Putin. And then it comes out that that's not true. And he says, well, maybe I got a little ahead of the evidence. I just sort of assume. It's like you... You ran the intelligence services. That's right. Right, You, well, you is, piece of crap, you were the head this is of what, the CIA. What's so beautiful about this, I agree with you that it's a negative victory. It's not a positive victory. Yeah. Like bringing down the, however, the destruction of the mainstream media, that I, as I've been saying for many years, mm-hmm. the thing about the mainstream media is not the way they cover Trump. I'm happy to have the media go after the president. He's a powerful man. I want all powerful people to be hunted like dogs. That's, that's his <laughs> absolutely great American... He's a French revolutionary. Yeah, yeah, great American <laughs> journalism. However, it's what they did with Obama for eight years. They turned a blind eye during the IRS scandal, the Fast and Furious scandal. It, he turned every department. You know, you talk about J- Jesse Smollett. He turned Washington into Chicago. Yeah. And what happened, all these guys who did this, the John Brennans, yeah. the James Clappers, the James Comeys, they're all his guys. And it's because they press acted as a ring of invisibility. That It was like they turned Obama into Gollum. When Gollum well, this the, was, the, this the, was a great line. The they kept telling about how Obama, his biggest scandal, scandal was the khaki suit. It was the khaki free. suit. Yeah. 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 Just, the, the, the truest thing ever uttered by an Obama was actually uh, uttered by uh, the first lady, Michelle Obama, recently unseated from her number one position <laughs> on the New York Times bestseller. Who, who did that? I can't remember. Uh, uh, it was an all-right guy, I think. It was an all-right guy. And she said, unironically, we're going to bring South Side Chicago values to Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah, and all I know about the values of the South Side Chicago, all I know about the South Side Chicago is that it's the baddest part of town. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I know about right, The only film clip anybody knows about Chicago is Al Capone beating someone to death with a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> so the only thing lower right now than the uh, media's credibility rating is Michael Knowles' credit score. Oh, the credit you know, score. <laughs> you know how I know about that? <laughs> Lightstream. Lightstream. What, what a segue. I worked great. on that segue. <laughs> We do not, I'll tell you why we don't jest about life stream. You're talking to a man who, if left to his own devices, would spend himself into the ground. If I didn't have, if my wife didn't take care of me, as you all know, I would be this living in the kept man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a kept man. I better be a kept man or I'm, <laughs> I'm lost. We do this, all of us. We take our, our credit card, we spend it, and then the bill comes due, and then suddenly you're looking at 18% APR interest. I mean, that is a genuine credit card interest rate. If you get Lightstream, you can refinance your high interest credit card balances and save with a credit card consolidation loan. Lightstream will get you a rate as low as 6.14% APR oh, with auto pay. You gotta use auto pay. The rate is fixed, it never goes up. You can get a loan from 5,000 to 100,000 bucks and there are no fees. And you can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. Plus, because we're here, because of us, you can save even more. Our listeners get an additional interest rate discount the only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash backstage. It's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash backstage. And now I have to read this part. Ready? I read it really quick. Get it right. Subject to credit approval. Rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash backstage. Or more. Were That's you really improvising good. that last part? I just made the really good ad read, but I can do the last part faster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what it needs. It needs a fast talker. I can't. Yeah, I'm exactly. not a fast talker. Well, you know, 
on, so, so here's the question on a going forward basis. What should Trump focus on when it comes to the Mueller report? Should he let it go? Should he try and ram this down the necks of Democrats? Like, what, what do you think is useful here? My, my, uh, my personal feeling on this is that he should obviously go at the media. Um, but that if he tries to turn this into a cause to love about, we're go I'm going to uncover the corruption in the, in the FBI and the CIA, and we're going to go after all the nefarious actors, it feels good. But on a political grounds, I'm not sure that that just doesn't look like petty vindictiveness as opposed to, they because remember, there's another half to this story, which is that everybody's saying, you know, the media were humiliated, which is true. The Democrats were humiliated, which is true. The truth is also that Donald Trump spent two years saying that Robert Mueller was a shill of the left who was going to indict him. <laughs> yeah. right? And then Robert Mueller turned out to be honest, right? Robert yeah, Mueller ended up doing his job, yep. which many of us were saying that that was probably going to happen. Right. So him going after everybody now, it seems like now would be the time where it's magnanimity in victory, at least to the intelligence community generally. Yeah, I can't and, agree or, with just, or just yeah. ignore it and move on to the media are garbage. They've been paid. And then every time they attack him, he says, you guys were garbage on this, you're garbage on that too. Yeah, you know, I can't quite go with this for, for a couple of reasons. One, Carl Rove says he should do this, so we know it's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> well, no, Carl, no, Carl, 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 Rove, Carl Rove, by his own admission, said his biggest mistake was basically positioning Bush above the fray. And so the fray took Bush to pieces. They took him, yeah. you know, they blamed him for the weather in New Orleans, you know, yeah. hurricane, oh, that's your fault. And, and Bush never struck back because he had too much dignity. I don't think we have to worry about Trump having too much dignity. I also don't, I also don't think magnanimity is actually in his holster. I don't think he actually has that mm. weapon. So what I would do if I were he, I, was, I would definitely go after the corruption. I would definitely make a lot of noise. Nobody's going to jail over this. Hillary Clinton's not going to jail. Nobody's going. But I would just make noise about it while doing other things. One of the things about Trump that I really do appreciate is a lot of the noise he makes covers up the fact that he's doing some important stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, he actually does things that, that matter to us. Like he's, re, he's revamping Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which I think is a huge deal. And he does that like off to the side while everybody's focusing on the noise. That, that's one possibility. The other possibility is he doesn't even know that. <laughs> that is a possibility too. Wait, but yeah. here's my problem with him going after the intel. He's not running against the intel community in 2020. No, that's true. He's running no. against the Democrats. So run against Adam Schiff, run against Chuck Schumer. Run against all, the, all yeah. the Democrats who maintained that this was the, it was always the end for Trump. Run against the media, because everybody hates the media, as well they should. But running against, like, no, who cares? Like, James Clapper isn't a big enough person for him to punch at, except he, like, say what you want tonight, right? Tonight's his, his rally in Michigan. Yeah. Let him do his oh, thing. Oh, yeah, have a victory lap. Exactly. But like, the, enjoy important thing, the important thing, though, that is on his side is that so many people have been gutted from the FBI that if the New York Times ran a front page headline as it did during Watergate, every time a guy quit, We'd all be sitting around going, this is the biggest scandal ever. This has gutted the intelligence community. But they're all gone. And the, the people who are there are good. You know, most FBI agents are great cops yep. and they're doing a great job. And so he, doesn't, he can constantly praise the people who are there now. He's really talking about Obama. And the people running are echoes of Obama. You got Eric Holder making these stupid comments about how we should all feel guilty. America was never great. You got Joe Biden apologizing for American jurisprudence. <laughs> you know? like, I mean, so, so it's a reminder of who he's running against and why he's there in the first place. And so I, I've got an interesting question to kind of take it in a slightly different direction. Why did this story stick? the way that it did. It, it occurs to me that you could say because the echo chamber is so vast and they were so dedicated to it. But I tend to think that most false narratives that stick do so because they have some air of plausibility. What made this story seem plausible uh, and therefore what allowed it to get the kind of traction that it did? I mean, I think two factors. And this is actually a, a question that I think is pretty well substantiated, the, the, the answer anyway. Two factors. One, everyone thought Hillary would win. When she didn't win, it had to be something nefarious that <laughs> meant that she didn't win. The Democrats still cannot understand that Hillary was the worst candidate in American history. And then she proceeded to lose to the second worst candidate in American history. <laughs> so they can't deal with that. And so what they've done is they've channeled that into, it must have been stolen somehow. It's like Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Right. They just, they're, they're, yeah. We can't deal with this. The second thing is that Donald Trump with Russia is weird. Mm -hmm. He was weird. The entire campaign, he was weird. Right? He was saying things like, well, you know, we, he said to Bill O'Reilly, we kill people too, just like Putin kills people. You know, we're not better. And he's, and he's saying out loud at his rallies, I hope that Putin hacks our emails. And so if you put those two dots together, and it seems like for a lot of the left, that's really what it was, because they were firmly convinced. I mean, really firmly convinced that this was going to happen. You see that in Rachel Maddow's ratings. They dropped 500,000 people yeah, amazing, in yeah. one night amazing, as soon yeah. as this happened, which shows you the kind of wish casting that was happening. Not to be too self-aggrandizing, but I'm going to point out that when I was on Bill Maher's show, this was exactly the debate. I said to Bill Maher, you could just be reasonable, right? You could just say, 
Mueller's going to find what Mueller's going to find, and I have faith that he's going to uncover the evidence. And I haven't seen any evidence thus far of actual collusion. And Mara's like, you really don't believe? Yeah, no, he was stunned. Collusion? I don't remember that. You, yeah, yeah. smart young man. Right, he kept saying, I just can't believe that you, he said, you don't? I said, I said, I don't believe that there was collusion because I don't see any evidence of it. He goes, you don't? Like, he just see, couldn't, I, I he could there's... not fathom the possibility there wasn't because it answers all the questions. It's, it's, it's an answer. It answers why Hillary lost. Right. It answers why Trump is weird. It speaks to the idea that Trump is not, also, I think there's a, a, a real sense of digging at Trump because they really don't like the idea that Trump deep down is kind of a patriotic dude. And so it bothers them. When he says, make America great, they, they want to feel like they are more patriotic than Donald Trump is. So saying that he's a Russian is, Manchurian candidate This is, is kind of a leftist things. version of the birther thing, though, because the, the, right, the right. left was constantly saying that the birther uh, conspiracy was a racist thing. Or Trump was racist because he said he was from Kenya. That was about Obama's difference. Obama was not like other presidents. He wasn't patriotic like other presidents. He didn't have that sense of American exceptionalism that other presidents, every other president, every other president had had. There was something about him that was not one of us, and it was not the color of his skin. It was the color of his philosophy. And so that thing, it stuck with people, even after we knew it was untrue. Right, it was the same it, thing people it, were saying about how he's secretly a Muslim. It was this, yes, it was this he was feeling different. Of, and, right, it was a and, feeling of, of foreignness. And, and Trump, and like Trump is the front, same, front Trump is the same way. Him. Trump is like a, a loose cannon. We're not quite sure of him. And when they say things like that, everybody thinks, well, maybe that, that might you, be you true. You know, the other reason why it's stuck, though. Which By the way, the birth of the thing is dumb. We all agree the birth of the thing is dumb. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. By he, we all, you mean all of us except the president, <laughs> who is like the loudest <laughs> proponent of it first. The, the other reason why it's stuck is because it was a totally cooked up, contrived narrative pushed on every single medium. And, and I think mm. we're not giving that enough credit. Yeah. It, it actually That's reminds good. me of the Michael Jackson documentary, that <laughs> Leaving Neverland thing on HBO. Yeah. How for so long did we, we saw this guy sleeping in beds with children for a long period of time, and we said, no, it couldn't be. And it's celebrity. You had government celebrities at the DOJ and the FBI telling us this guy was working with Russia. You had political celebrities, electeds, mm. Hillary Clinton, all Adam Schiff, all of these people. And you had news celebrities wearing ties with nice combed hair and makeup saying night after night for 791 consecutive days, an average of three minutes a night, that Donald Trump colluded with the Russians. The, and it was a, a total lie. It was a total empire of lies, to use your <laughs> phrase. Yeah. But I, that's part of it. And that's not Donald Trump's fault. And it's not the fault of a guy who had a weird tabloid So, so I, I want to talk a little bit more about Trump's attitude toward Russia during the election, which I do think is a factor in this. But you, you just raised something really interesting that I had not previously considered, uh, which is that before Barack Obama, the government was not an organization that was trusted by the media. Mm. One of the massive changes that happened during the Obama administration is that, that you could have political celebrities who had sort of... Cachet. Cachet. Yep. Had, has that ever existed before? I mean, even when Clinton was president, was it the case that... The, it, it, I've, that never seen, I've never seen well, a news media defend the intelligence community well, from, this people, is, from doubters. That was one of the most this, shocking parts. This is parts what I was about to say, is that this may be, in many ways, the most damaging scandal in modern American history. Bigger than the WMD thing. Because mm -hmm. the WMD yeah. thing, people said Bush lied, Bush did not lie. No, the and entire the, intelligence community, and the media, everywhere and the media on Earth, and the media, yeah, yeah. and the Democrats, they all believed this stuff. And it right. turned out that Saddam Hussein was the one who was lying right. about, his, about his weapons capacity. And despite the fact that, the, again, a terrible thing the president has said, implying the president that Bush lied us into war and all of that. This one, the, our institutions, the institutions that we are supposed to trust, their institutional credibility was leveraged for this narrative. That's mm -hmm. right. right. It wasn't yeah, like they just reported right. the what came out. They, things, they, yeah. they leveraged the institution. Yeah. And, and key players in these institutions leveraged the institutional credibility in favor of these narratives. That's why I think that whatever he has to say about Brennan and Clapper and Comey is absolutely warranted because these are people who were, yeah. were leading our intelligence. Peter Strzok, these were people leading our intelligence yeah. agencies, and they were going on national television night after night and suggesting they had secret knowledge because they led these intelligence agencies, and they knew in a way that you didn't know. Right. And Adam Schiff doing the same thing. I'm on the intelligence committee. No, I know yeah. in a way that you don't know. Yeah, it and is then, McCarthy. And, yeah. and so when that collapses, how am I supposed to have faith in an intelligence community when people are legitimately using my trust against my and, trust. And, I mean, by it's, the, it's, and by the same token, this is the same news uh, uh, media that told us, oh, you have to love us because we're the ones who ferret out the flaws of power. Right. And the, democracy here they were telling, dies in darkness. Yeah, democracy oh, dies in darkness. And here they were saying, what do you mean? You don't, you don't trust the CIA? No, I don't trust the CIA. <laughs> I, I don't, don't trust the yeah. NSA. They were spying on me. You know, why should I? The, the idea of the press after Watergate, the press since Watergate, 
suddenly coming out and defending our institutions, and then the institutions turning out to be, in fact, corrupt. I mean, this is the thing. Every time I see Carl Bernstein, I think you have become what you beheld. You became mm -hmm. the thing that you exposed. You are, you are now Richard Nixon. And that's an amazing irony, and it's an amazing uh, truth that's been kind of right beneath the surface for a long time. I mean, and, and the media cannot accept what's happened. No. I they mean, if you watch they're, they're writing brick, articles about how they yeah. still did a fantastic job, yeah, how yeah. We, really, we really just went after the news. That, that note from Jeff Zucker, Oh, where, he, where he suggested... We're not investigators. <laughs> we're not, we're, we just report what comes across our desk. Really, is that what you were doing? It's like Dr. Strange. Really? Well, you, know, you can't you do mean, news you mean, in here, there's a CNN. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mean the Chirons with the parentheses, editorials? Yeah. I mean, what I want is a Chiron on CNN that says Trump-Russia collusion proved wrong, and then in parentheses, and we failed. <laughs> right? Because that, that is the reality. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. And you know, by the way, a, a news media that's 90% Democrat at the editorial level is corrupt per se. If you cannot right. be, that, this whole argument that they always say, well, I can be a Democrat and still be fair. One person can be a Democrat and still be fair. A room full of Democrats can't be fair. And the idea that they have allowed the news media to become that, a spokesperson, basically, a spokesman arm for when the Democrat the When party. the Lear Center gives the Excellence in Journalism Award to <laughs> CNN for the yeah, uh, that Parkland town hall, the Parkland Town, town Hall, the most egregious amazing. single media event yeah. I've seen Outrageous. in 10 years. Yeah. And, and right. the NAACP, by the way, just nominated uh, Jesse Smollett, Smollett for <laughs> an, image, <laughs> an Image Award, <laughs> making me wonder, yeah, his image is good. But they should <laughs> nominate his two Nigerian attackers. I think they should get the image. <laughs> Those guys were wearing white face, though. Yeah. 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 We were told by yeah. So, so la that. last question on this topic, uh, it, Michael, for you. Why? Why? <laughs> Does. I don't mean, why are you asking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think his, his position will be the most interesting on this question. Why is Don, why was Donald Trump so up Putin's ass <laughs> for the entirety of the election? The only thing that Trump was completely consistent about, never equivocated for even a moment in 2016 during the election, was that he respects Vladimir Putin, we're just like uh, Putin's Russia. I mean, you could not get the guy yeah, well, uh, no, there, there are plenty of, first of all, he was much less up Putin than Barack Obama was when he said, I have more flexibility after my election to Medvedev. No, no, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, he was, all, he Barack was Obama, offering strategic Barack Obama literally Barack. colluded with That's Barack. right, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> but the question is, why was why Trump, was Trump a, a Putin sycophant I'll, during the election? I'll tell you exactly why. Because, one, his view of politics is much more realpolitik, for lack of a better term. His mm. view of politics is not terribly idealistic or ins inspirational or aspirational. It is pretty brutal and it's pretty New York. He also talks like a New Yorker. So he tells jokes such as, hey, what do you think? Do you think the Russians are hacking the, the emails of Hillary Clinton? I don't know, I but so. we can't find them, so I sure hope they release them. <laughs> so in the, yeah. in the final analysis, it can only be that Donald Trump did not believe he was going to be president and was buttering up Putin so that he could build condos in <laughs> no, Moscow. I, I don't think it's or, that. It's that Donald Trump's view of politics is yes. you flatter strong men, you never criticize well, strong not, men. Not that. He all, you'll notice with Donald Trump, he only attacks people who attack him first. The classic mm, example, okay, this, this is, is Rosie this is O'Donnell. The, this is the real answer. Yeah. Okay, so all of your intellectualization crap is just intellectual. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't have any real politic view of anything. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't know how to spell real politic. He thinks that it has a C and a K. At the end, but it's, but it's, For a <laughs> dummy, he did a pretty good job. He got himself elected, you know, okay, pretty don't well. Okay, don't get it. I mean, like, seriously, like, there, have you seen Congress? All these people got themselves elected. They have a collective IQ lower than the, than the IQ of this that's table. True. That's but true. Is it, but that's, the, that's actually the best answer to that question. But, <laughs> but, but, but no, the real answer is that Donald Trump loves people who flatter him, and he hates people who do not. He has done this with Kim Jong-un, okay? It's not unique to, mm. to any of these people. And everybody knows this, which is why... Which is why even Justin Trudeau tried to flatter him for a little while. And then as soon as Justin Trudeau hit him, suddenly... Donald Trump went from, I love Justin Trudeau, to Justin Trudeau is Satan. <laughs> but He's just it, handsome but Satan. Hasn't everybody fallen for Putin? I mean, didn't Obama, didn't George W. Yeah, Bush? Yeah, George W. Bush I mean, said, guy, I saw the guy, soul. A, the guy is a gangster. Putin is Al Capone running a country. That's who he is. Well, he's and yet one president after another. He, well, you I know, know, honestly, I think he, I see his heart. I he's, see his, he's, yeah. the, no, this is, he is the constant temptation, Putin, because what Putin does is he's like, well, if you could somehow get me, then the world would be at peace because uh, yeah, we'd right. be allied and you'd be allied and everything would be yeah. great and everybody is thinking back to the end of the Cold War and they're thinking, it's so true. If we yeah. could finally be on the same yeah. side. I can't believe he's that, as bad as he is. Plus those concepts. That's, right. yeah. well, that's the other thing is that nobody in, in modern politics understands that Vladimir Putin 
is not a modern political leader. That's right. Vladimir Putin right. is a thug circa 1946. Yep. Vladimir Putin, the guy has invaded two separate countries <laughs> yep. in the last decade, yep. Yep. right? There's no one else on earth who has invaded a country right. in the last decade, at least in the in, in the industrialized world. Absolutely. He's invaded two of them and he's yeah, gotten right. away with it both times. No, we we invaded deal. some countries, yeah. but not, uh, not to annex their territory. Right, that's what I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, yeah. he legitimately tried to annex both Georgia and, and Crimea. Yeah. And, it, and it accomplished no, it. No, he's, he's, he's the real deal. He's yeah. a real bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bravo Company Manufacturing, if we were going to invade another country <laughs> for the purpose of annexation, <laughs> you would want these guys by your side, right? More importantly, if you wanted to protect yourself from, oh, I mean, yeah, well, yeah. let's be better about this. If, if we were invaded, you'd want Bravo Company Manufacturing well, you you that on your side. Well done. Huh? Yeah, you know, we're all, we're all on the same side when it comes to defending our right to bear arms and here, here. All, all the other rights that we have are defended by that right to bear arms. We all in this room believe in that principle. I obviously believe in that principle. Piers Morgan doesn't believe in that principle, but you know who does? <laughs> Bravo Company Manufacturing. BCM was started in a garage by a Marine veteran more than two decades ago to build a professional grade product that meets combat standards. BCM believes the same level of protection should be provided to every American, regardless of whether they're a private citizen or a professional. BCM is not a sporting arms company. They design, they engineer, they manufacture life-saving equipment. They assume that every rifle that leaves the shop will be used in a life or death situation mm -hmm. by a responsible citizen, a law enforcement officer, or a soldier overseas. Every component of a BCM rifle is hand assembled and tested by Americans to a life-saving standard. They feel a moral responsibility at Bravo Company Manufacturing to provide tools that will not fail the user when it's not just a paper target, but somebody who's actually coming to do you harm. To learn more about Bravo Company Manufacturing, head on over to bravocompanymfg.com. You can discover more about their product special offers Upcoming news, that's bravocompanymfg.com. We love this company. They're really <laughs> terrific. They do terrific work, founded by great folks. Need more convincing? Find out even more about BCM and the amazing people who make their products at youtube.com slash bravocompanyusa. That is youtube.com slash bravocompanyusa. Go check them out. Great American company. What I love most about some so many of our sponsors, Bravo Company is, is a great example of it. Uh, our friends at Black Rifle Coffee who were here with They're us uh, visiting yesterday is that they just own what they are. They're unapologetic yeah. mm -hmm. uh, about what they are, who they serve, uh, and why. Yep. And you, you know, in today's uh, that's age, a good thing. that's, a, that's yeah. a pretty good thing. Alicia, we want to hear from some of our Daily Wire subscribers. They're the reason that we are here today and able to afford all these fancy cameras. Do you have anything for us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to unapologetically drink this pina colada. No, I'm kidding. It's a virgin. Too bad. All right, we do have some questions. I mean, I think, I think it's pretty funny when uh, the pregnant lady is seen drinking on camera. <laughs> <laughs> because, because you know, we're a traditional company with family values. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you guys would all probably be the ones like in the cigar, like in the waiting room while your wife is in labor with the cigar in the oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're that, nice is, that is untrue. I watched my wife give birth both times. Uh, uh, so, so did I. I'm well, joking. because right. that's it's pretty great. It's great. It was it's, fantastic. It's, it's unbelievable yeah, for me. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have to do it. it, looked, it looked, <laughs> no, but one of the great experiences. It was amazing. I just yeah. want to be there when Noel's wife eventually. Well, I got to tell you, I, I, I don't know any of my children, but I assume I was smoking a cigar <laughs> while they were being born. <laughs> so. Statistically. Statistically speaking, <laughs> that's almost a certainty. There's going to be a Netflix documentary about Michael Knowles and all of his illegitimate children in like 10 years. <laughs> did, why didn't we know? We knew. Well, we it was, was right in front of us. He was saying it on the show. Leaving backstage. <laughs> Michael Knowles. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> all right. First question comes from Lance. He wants to know, do you think that Trump has pushed conservatives towards a big government mentality? And why aren't we seeing Democrats turn away from a big government mentality when they say Trump has too much power? True. I, I, I do not think that uh, Trump has pushed conservatives toward a bigger government mentality. I think he has dialed back government in very uh, important ways, especially in the regulatory way, which is one of the worst. He's appointed judges who seem more uh, inclined to limit the powers of government to those enumerated in the Constitution or something like. The one thing he has done, has, has not done, which is really a problem, is that he has not addressed, addressed entitlement and spending. And entitlements and spending are basically the same thing. And he has he promised the people, he knows the people are dependent on that, he knows the people in the Midwest who lost so many jobs uh, in the last administration the min and the end of the administration before, he knows they need that stuff, and so he will not come out and say, Look, these, these Social Security was put in place when people died at 63. It kicked in at 65. When you live to 80, you got to work longer to make more wealth to live off in your retirement. It's true for individuals, true for the country, and that's the only thing, the only way in which I feel he's let the government get out of control. Um, I, I think that the key here is that the government was already out of control when Trump got there. Well, well, right, I think yeah. everybody starts to think that the world began to spin when Trump became president. Mm -hmm. It's like when people look at the 
1996 Australia gun ban. They say, oh, look how the murder rate went down after that. And it's like, yeah, look before that, how the murder rate was going down. It's a straight line. It continues in the same direction right. after the gun ban. So there's no actual market effect. The direction of the government was already getting bigger before Trump got there. Trump got there. He didn't make it any smaller. It continues to grow at record rates because Republicans are effectively full of crap when it comes to spending. Well, spending and this has yeah. been true forever. And also, you can't get a consensus on cutting anything because the American people lie to ourselves all the time. We're always like, we want a small government with fewer services. And then they're like, okay, how about this one? Like, no. Like that, <laughs> Not one. that one. Yeah, I like this that one. Bill, Bill Maher is right about this. Bill Maher says Americans like socialism. And my answer to that is they like opiates too, just because they like it doesn't mean it's good for you. you know? <laughs> well, we, we like socialism without the cost. Right. Right. We, they, like that's what, whenever, they, whenever they pull yeah. Medicare for all, it's like, yeah. yeah. And then they're like, well, we're going to get rid of your private health care plan and your taxes are going to be 60%. And we're like, oh, well, yeah. actually, Yikes. we're kind of good. Like, <laughs> well, we're, we're okay. Like, we're yeah. kind of good. The, I mean, the, the last Republican president to cut spending was... Calvin Coolidge. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody mm-hmm. has done Reagan didn't do it. Bush one didn't do it. Bush two didn't do it. So conservatives have embraced their bigger uh, spending priorities for a very long time. But I actually think even with the tariffs, which many Republican presidents have engaged in tariffs, many conservatives have, have liked tariffs. So going back to Abraham Lincoln, I think he's actually a fairly mainstream conservative guy, at least in his governance. Who knows about his policy, ideology? That's right. That's and, right. And, and policy, he also, that's right. He also is, is pretty restrained when it comes to constitutional governance. He waits for the courts to make decisions. He's never mm-hmm. done, I mean, he's done some of the executive order stuff that uh, Obama did, but not anywhere near as badly and not in the same kinds of context. He's actually, for all the screaming about what an authoritarian he is. No, he hasn't, he hasn't colored, fundamentally broken the institution. He's colored within no, the right. lines, yeah. No. yeah. That's right. Alicia. All right, I think I know who this subscriber is. This question comes from Laurel. She wants to know, is it realistic to try to become an artist these days, or is it a foolish thing to pursue? (laughs) Michael, I think we better let you take this. (laughs) Hey, Laurel. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I would say, and if if you're the Laurel I'm thinking of, then you're a wonderful artist. You might have seen on Twitter, uh, one of the Daily Wire viewers, Laurel, paints these pictures of us, and they're beautiful pictures. You can be a very good artist. I will. If, speak, by the way, if you're not the Laurel that we think you are... Then, well, that's a coincidence. That's really, yeah, gosh, who are you? I will. I think it's important for me to answer this question rather than say, like, Drew, you know, because Drew's a very, very successful <laughs> artist who's yeah, made a lot of money on his it's, art. It's, it's an illusion. Yeah. And I think I've made about $17 <laughs> in my artistic life. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful thing to do, though. If, if you want to... Be an artist. If you have something to say, if you have uh, some artistic expression, you should do it. You shouldn't ruin your life because of it. You shouldn't allow your life to fall apart and sit around waiting for the phone to ring or some magic to happen. You should be out there. You were always working a zillion jobs while you were writing your early novels, I think. Yes, no, no. But I mean, my answer to this question is always if you can do anything else. Do it. Do it. If If you're like me and you can't, you literally can't stop then you're an artist and you have to find a way to make a living. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the answer. Yeah. But I, I will say that the romance of poverty does not apply to people actually in poverty. A- absolutely, <laughs> right. absolutely. And there's this whole oh, thing no, with the starving artist, pauper, and it's like bull You know, the, the, gra- the greatest yeah. art of its time is usually the art that makes the most money. When, when, people, when poetry was at its height in England during the romantic period, Keats, Wordsworth, Shelley, all those great poets, you got famous if you got a bit best-selling poem, you know. Mm-hmm. God, so that, I that's not that. true now. <laughs> and Cardi B is the greatest art of our time. <laughs> the other point on these, the other point on these famous artists, like really the ones we think, T.S. Eliot, Chekhov, Wallace Stevens. I'm talking about poets, Dana Joya. These yeah. guys, all were working jobs and yeah. taking care of their families. Yeah. Good jobs, insurance salesmen, doctors, all yeah. these sort of things. They were doing, it, and I so agree. I, I have a lot of actor friends who are really good, who are really talented actors. And they're making $17 a hit doing off-off-Broadway theater. And they're living in misery. And they don't yeah. need to live in misery. They, they could actually do something productive with could their time They could learn to code. They could learn to code. Right. 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 Now our show's going to get kicked yeah, exactly. off. <laughs> One thing interesting about the Laurel that we know, though, is she may be specifically talking about visual art which is something that none of the four of us have a lot of no. uh, of experience with. But I do have one thought about it, which is we live in an age where uh, we basically have embraced the literal. So if you think about uh, a, a film is more literal than a play, right? And a YouTube video is more literal than a film. And so everything, all the trend, a photograph is more literal than a painting. Than yeah. a painting. So all art in the modern age moves towards literalism. And the problem with literalism uh, is that it's, you know, it leaves someone like Laurel, the Laurel we know anyway, in a, in a place where it would probably be very difficult to understand how, what is the role 
a visual artistic expression, you know, painting, drawing, in a world that has so embraced mm. more literal yeah. forms. Yeah. Is, is there a place for a painter? Is there a place for uh, uh, a sketch artist it's, in today's it, it, it may be a dated, you know, Impressionism comes in as photography comes in, and it may be, mm. in fact, mm. a dated form. That doesn't mean that no great artist will ever come along, just like there are great playwrights, even though the theater is no longer our main f form of talking to one another. I mean, I think there's but, great but, art being made in the digital space. I th well, that's what I was I going to say. The digital space the, is unbelievable. Some of, the, some of the video games and the fact that you can enter mm. into those worlds as you play, that's something new, and I've never you, seen it before, and it's brilliant. Did yeah. you see this? There's this, this new Netflix series, and it's not all good. But there's something that's called Love, Death, and Robots. No. And it was made by, da it's made by David Fincher. Oh, yeah. And it's, a lot of it is just different types of animation. Hmm. And it doesn't all work, but it's like these little 10-minute snippets. He just decided we're going to make the series and we're not going to make it half an hour long. All these things are eight to 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. And it's, re it's, it's all different types of art. And the art is just astonishing. It's, it it's amazing. It's, it's really and, and the experience of playing a game, I mean, we've talked about this before, but the experience of playing a game is so immersive yeah. that you get that thing that you used to have to use your there, imagination There's still great for. art. I mean, yeah. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is a piece of art. It, well, right. yeah, Into the Spider-Verse is a beautiful piece of art. And maybe this is part of the answer for someone like Laurel, is that you have to find a modern application for those yeah. sort of antiquated skills, and that could be in the form of animation. We have great illustrators and animators who work for us. It could be uh, some sort of graphic design for which there's a, a huge home. It could be video game uh, design for which there's, I mean, it's bigger than Hollywood, one of the biggest markets. But I do think, you know, art has always been subsidized by the wealthy. This is correct. Even, right. even in America, art is, yeah, is that's, ultimately that's right. subsidized by the wealthy. Uh, but you do have to find the place where the wealthy are willing to exploit it, where they're willing to subsidize it. And so part of it is finding some application for your... There's nothing artistic about balance. rejecting the reality of the world. Yeah. So there, there's this, there's this some so There's true. this thing I see among young artists, particularly people who are actors who have scripts and are working at Coffee Bean, where it's like, if only the world were fair, if only there were a market for this thing that <laughs> yeah. I'm doing. And it's like, well, yeah. no. the, the, the unhappiest people in the world are the people who argue with fundamental realities yep. that they cannot control. No, that's yeah, really, it's, why it's why teachers always get so bent out of shape about their pay, right? They're always like, you know, teachers should make more than Congress people. And I always think, well, I mean, there's only you know 435 Congress people in the country. Like they, you know, they they got themselves elected to something unique and special. But I agree. What break I'm, the teachers' unions, and then you get paid. A lot. Yeah. And then you get paid a lot more. But it is this thing of like, teachers have never gotten paid more than this. When you decided to pursue becoming a mm -hmm. teacher, you you there was an understanding of what the reality. Maybe it's fair. Maybe it's may, I think it's fair. Maybe you think it's not fair. But it is. And, and one of the great lessons that you helped me learn in my own career as a young artist <laughs> who wasn't making any money, I was once young, and I once didn't make any money. <laughs> and Ben helped me understand, it. it is not, there is no pathway to a happy life peeing into the wind. Yep. Well, well, and, and the true. answer isn't yeah. that you have to stop peeing. It's that you have to turn around. <laughs> well, it, but it's also it also it's you know, beautiful. You know, every, every, <laughs> it's good advice. It yeah, is my advice. But, but everything is a choice. Everything is a choice. You know, we live in a city where some handsome Dan who's never done a thing for anybody can get paid a quarter of a million dollars a week pretending to be a police officer who risks his life. Right? <laughs> yeah. Where if you're a police officer, pretending you're making, to be maybe a man who was victimized by a racial hoax <laughs> in Chicago. <laughs> exactly. yeah. but, but if you if you are a an actual police officer, officer actually helping people and risking your life, you make what Jesse Smollett makes a, a week in a year. And That's so right. you just have to make, say, this is the choice I'm making. That's the choice. But you can't say, oh, I should be paid more. Right. You say, this is the choice I make mm -hmm. because I love helping people, because I love getting shot at and treated badly by the press. And, and, that, <laughs> and that's what I'm doing. Racing into, <laughs> racing into buildings that are on fire. Yeah. Yeah. Or putting up with kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. teachers, that, teachers that, do do a heroic, uh, I yeah. don't want to sound like I'm and down on teachers. I just, mostly I just want to clip that and we can use it in the LAPD press release. <laughs> 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 Alicia, one more question. I'm still really bummed that y'all were knocking Cardi B. I mean, everyone knows that she just makes money moves. That's so. true. She does make money moves by drugging men and then, <laughs> and then robbing them. Hey, that hey, works, right? She didn't, you know, she didn't have to specify in that song how she made money moves. You know? yeah, that's but right. then later she, also, she did, and that was great. Yeah. And she does that, like, thing. I don't know how she does it. I really want to master it, though, and it just annoy the well, heck out of Ben when I do it. I don't even know if you want to know how she got to know how to do that, Alicia. <laughs> so I, I would, I would really Alicia, know. the question. <laughs> For God's sakes, Alicia. Oh, dear God. Sam, I'm going down the wrong path. Sam wants to know, will the left's newfound anti-Semitism really alienate left-leaning Jews, considering that many are already reform or secular and will likely favor their political identity over their religious identity? Well, I think the only person allowed to answer yes. that question is Yes, Mr. let's hear it. Why, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is, as always, 
that Jews who care about Judaism are going to be offended by this, and Jews who do not care about Judaism are not going to be offended by this because they don't care about Judaism. This is like saying, will Maisie Hirono's anti-Catholic rhetoric alienate Catholics? And the answer is, if you're a practicing Catholic, yes, it will. Yeah. And if you're not a practicing Catholic, you won't give two dams about it. And this is true for Jews also. Mm -hmm. There's this weird thing in the press because many members of the press are secular Jews who still have cultural affiliation with Jewishness, which means they have a bagel once in a while. They like matzo ball soup. They've seen Fiddler on the Roof like three times, <laughs> maybe even a fourth time. And then they and they go to synagogue like once a year, maybe. And then they break for lunch on Yom Kippur. And it's like, well, now I'm Jewish because I'm not a white person. I'm a Jewish person. And it allows them a certain level of minority status. And that's what they care about in Judaism. That's not Jewishness, right? No. That's, that's, that's cultural Jewishness, sort of. But it's not really anything related to the Jewish religion or Jewish principles. You would say it's, the Torah, it's Jewish. Or, <laughs> right, it's, it, it, I would say culturally Jewish, but not religiously Jewish in any sense. And then the media poll people by ethnic Judaism, which again makes no sense because there are plenty of people. Noam Chomsky is an ethnic Jew. He's also a piece of crap. So like, why, why would I? Bernie Sanders is an ethnic Jew. What does he care about Judaism? He's an open militant atheist who hates Israel and thinks that the Bible is antiquated. Like, why, right. why would I pull him? So my answer is the people who care about principles that Judaism stands for are going to be offended by this. I think right. they'll be main, there's a group of older Jews particularly, people who are above the age of 60, who have historically voted Democrat, who still care about the state of Israel, who still care about going to synagogue, even if it's conservative or reform, and they will be offended. And you'll see a little bit of drop off there. Yeah. But young Jews who don't have any affiliation aren't religious, like, I, I, I'm, ask, honestly, I'm so bewildered why people would think it would be hmm. any different. Yeah. This can question I, is so bewildering. Whenever, whenever anybody asks me a question about why do the Jews vote Democrat, I say they don't. Right. Yeah. The, <laughs> the Orthodox Jews vote 70, 30, or 80, 20 Republican. Yeah. Follow-up question. Yeah. Slice, toast slice bagels, yes or no? <laughs> what the F was that? <laughs> what was that? Did you see that? There's a bagel and they sliced it vertically? I mean, my, my feeling is... My feeling uh, is hell kind of goyish and nonsense you, is this. You, you, can't, you can't do a bagel wrong, so it, it's not terrible. But where do you put all the locks and the <laughs> yeah, no, scallion like, cream cheese? Yeah. Where do you put that hey, guys, on a sliced... You want to know something true? Yeah. It's absolutely 100% true. I'm from Texas. I have never had a bagel. Oh my what? lord. Mm. I don't, how are you my business partner? <laughs> I'm okay, pretty so sure that I made show. it 30 years before I met anyone so, who had had a bagel. Okay, so, okay, I'm going to tell everybody in LA, best bagels, they are kosher. Western Bagel, they have a factory yep. on Sepulveda they Boulevard. You go, they bake them fresh. So they take them out of the fat, they put them in the window. They are the best bagels in the history of mankind. No. So after, oh, after no, this, no, no. Best bagels in the history of mankind New York. are in New York. They're in New York. They are in New York. Oh, never, whatever, New York. No, they are. They are the bagel right. have, you, have you had Western bagels, though? Yes. They I are, they are no, really No, I got solid. them. You recommended them. I got them. But New York bagels are another planet. They, are, they really are. I don't know. Do you like the doughy or you like more of like I like the, the big doughy ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> Plus, people from New York don't know that there is anything outside of New York. <laughs> <laughs> it's the famous New Yorker cover, right? It's the best New Yorker cover ever, where it's the, the, New, New, Yorker, New, Yorker the New Yorker's view of the United States. <laughs> yes. And it's just, at the, in the foreground, you see New York, and then you just see Chicago and L.A., and there's not, and all of the, all <laughs> and of the United States is Japan three is inches distance, wide. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> if you want to sit in on this riveting conversation, maybe and die of secondhand lung smoke like fitness, you could become an annual subscriber during tonight's live stream. And you will automatically, automatically be entered to win a free trip to L.A. where you will get to watch a future taping of Backstage in person. And this is a true story. So we did this last week. We, and we were proud of ourselves. We were like, hey, guys, wouldn't it be cool uh, if we you know, found a fan out there who signs up during the podcast and during the live broadcast. And we will, we will, whatever it costs, we will fly them to L.A. We will put them up in a hotel and we will let them sit in. Uh, on a live taping of backstage, and so then after the show, all the there's this uh, uh, random number generator system that we use, and we pull up the number and we look, and the winner lives 48 miles <laughs> from, <laughs> from our studio. Best value, yeah. any prize ever. True given. fiscal conservatives. True yeah. fiscal conservatives. We are. You and a guest will be on set for the show and will get to meet us all afterward. Can you imagine anybody wanting this prize? No, this is not. <laughs> People Again, are unsubscribing. Yeah, we'll pause as we speak. <laughs> Go Let's to put Daily... it this way. We'll, we'll pawn this off on some poor sucker <laughs> who decides this is a thing. Go to dailywire.com right now if you're watching the live broadcast. Become an annual subscriber to be automatically entered for a chance to win. Plus, when you become an annual subscriber, you'll get the world famous leftist tears, hot or cold, tumbler. Everybody wants it. Mm -hmm. you, ever, you, you ever meet anybody on the street and they're like, Hey, Michael, can you hook me up with one of those leftist tears tumblers? And you're like, no. I can't, I bro. literally can't. By the, way, the thing is, though, this week, as we pitch this, the thing is, everybody watching is already a subscriber. Because if they don't have the tumbler, then they have long since drowned in the news cycle. They are <laughs> gone, dead and gone. There were no survivors. There were none. Can so we let's talk about, talk about another deal? one of the great stories Please. of the week. Yeah. Can we talk about the Green New Deal thing? Is the oh. best. Cocaine Mitch. 
Oh. I mean, you got to hand it to we Cocaine Mitch. Hang on. Love to Mitch. To, to Mitch. Mitch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think he's the tumble for this one. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> Mitch Escobar McConnell. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. So you, you undoubtedly, you know the story, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Cocaine Mitch. Wh- whom we must refer to as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or AOC and not as Cortez, which no, would no. be in so fresh. Of us. So face. So fresh. <laughs> so face. Uh, AOC comes up with this piece of legislation called the Green New Deal. She writes it. it. She writes it herself. It basically outlaws cow farts and everything. Mm-hmm. Literally all things plus cow farts. <laughs> and costs $93 trillion. Uh, and then they start berating the right for saying that it's a ridiculous piece of legislation. It, they say, this is our World War II. This is WW2. Mm-hmm. We're fighting the Nazis. And we have to put everything we have. The world will end end within 12 years. In 12 years. So this week, Mitch McConnell thinks, for for a laugh, and (laughs) just to make our week even better, he thinks, let's give him a chance to vote on the Green New Deal. He brings it to the floor of the Senate. But by the way, all of the Senate Democrats who are currently running for president co-sponsor the legislation. 12 co-sponsors, every one of them running for president. How many of them voted, Michael, for the Green New Deal? Uh, hold on, let me carry this out a bit. And none, none Zero. Of them, no Senate Democrats voted for the Green New Deal. The best part of the story, though, is that AOC gets asked on Twitter, why didn't the Senate Democrats try to save the world? You've condemned us to die. And AOC's react- answer was, because I encouraged them not to vote for it. <laughs> yeah, she's the boss. Right. She, that's, she, that's, she said that's, she encouraged them to vote present. That's to how vote present. Like, and that's how senators make their decision when the, the congresswoman when from first term. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could think is, why has she condemned us all to die? No, for 12 years. No, I, mean, no, so, I, I was assured by so the press, it was, it was not only important, it was deeply popular, I was told. Yeah, I was correct. told that this was popular, mm-hmm. particularly among the youngins, that they love nothing but having air travel banned and every building in the United States retrofitted or destroyed. That they were into <laughs> all of those things. And every single Democrat voted present except for four who voted against. Right. right? Yeah. Those are the ones in the red states. That was Manchin and Doug Jones and Kirsten Cinema, and then Angus King up in Maine, who's an independent but is a Democrat. And the and the best reaction was the reaction afterward. Because afterward they were all like, Can't believe the Republicans pulled this stunt. We wanted to hold <laughs> we wanted to hold debate on this. Like, well, but the purpose of debate for legislation usually is to get to, get to, the, to the vote. To get to yeah. the vote. And you guys were all like no, you know, we, we can't vote for this. Sorry. We, we just don't want to be associated. You know, it's it's a little bit much. It's a also, little much. A- Alexandria, I call her occasional cortex, uh, but Alexandria made a speech afterwards that was pure word salad. She was mm-hmm. talking about Flint, Michigan, where this Democrat town poured, the, <laughs> yeah. took the water out of the river and killed people with it while the Republicans were saying, <laughs> don't do that, don't do that. What does that have to do with cl- climate change? It has my, nothing to do with climate my change. My favorite thing was, have you seen the polls on her? They're brutal. Mm-hmm. I mean, people do not like her. Trump no. is more it's popular a, in New York than she is. Yeah. It, it turns out wow. that, that yeah. after all this media coverage, after putting her on the cover of Time magazine, I'm, after I'm treating her yeah. as though she is the face of the new Democratic Party, the more people see her, the more they dislike her. Yeah. Because when you see her at the beginning, you're like, oh, she's enthusiastic and kind of fun. And then you listen to the things coming out of her face, and you're like, these are bad things that come out yeah. of your face. And she's also mean. She's not a nice person. I mean, no. she really is. Well, you she... see this about Ilhan Omar also. I mean, I, yeah. oh. I mean, Ilhan Omar is just a nasty. Well, she's, she's, she's a, a nasty She's word. especially yeah. mean to guys like you. Yeah, my yeah. Friend. yeah. She, she don't like the yeah. Something about you she doesn't like. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is. Guys, <laughs> it's just that he's a supporter of Israel. <laughs> <laughs> That's her only problem. <laughs> this was one of the great moments. And then Mike Lee getting up on the oh, floor of the Senate. That was, he was. It was, it was magnificent. He deserves some kind of award. Oh, it was so great. Because for those who didn't see it, you should go watch it. He did a basically a Bob Newhart routine. He got up there with a, and he's very low key, Mike Lee. Right. He's he's a very serious guy. He was considered pretty seriously for the Supreme Court for the last for the last vacancy, and he gets up there with a picture of Ronald Reagan riding a velociraptor <laughs> while firing a machine gun with an RPG strapped to his back, <laughs> and he gives an entire disquisition describing the immense patriotism of the velociraptor, the velociraptor. that is holding <laughs> the flag in its tatter, the tattered flag. And, and then he says, this has as much to do with the Green New Deal as the Green New Deal has to do with stopping climate change. And then the press does what the press do. And this is why the common theme of Donald Trump's presidency, and it is why he is president, and it pre-existed Trump, and it will post-exist Trump. We hate the media. Yep. And we deserve and to they hate deserve the media. It. They deserve because it. they are sheer, freaking, burning, flaming <laughs> piles of garbage. Absolutely. The, way, the way that they covered the Mike Lee thing was such evidence of intellectual dishonesty. Like, I will acknowledge that Stephen Colbert is a comedian, and he was doing jokes. And I will acknowledge that Jon Stewart, who I really dislike, is doing jokes. 
I will acknowledge all of that. Right. But he's doing an obvious riff, Mike Lee. It's obviously a joke. He's obviously making fun of the stupidity of a, of a bill so bad, not a single Democrat voted in favor of it. And the headlines were, Mike Lee makes bizarre attack on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez using silly painting. It's like, that's called a comedy routine. Yeah, and it was, and it was genuinely funny, which it is, is really rare funny. in government. I mean, it was it's actually very funny. I wish that Senator Ted Cruz, hashtag the only senator I know, <laughs> would, have, <laughs> would have gotten up uh, during his remarks and just read Green Eggs and Ham. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would have it made it a perfect a week for me. I know. <laughs> it's pretty close to a perfect week. It is a really good week. This is, this is well, yeah, and since, since Kavanaugh, I've not been this Guys, I, even on the Green New Deal, we should, this story went unreported, but it happened during the throes. It actually happened on the greatest day ever when you, you were out. You were, you know, and getting medical I was having treatment. propofol, and, well, we, we missed one of these, right? Because mm-hmm. while I was having it, so I go in to get an endoscopy because I have esophagitis, which is this weird esophageal thing. And I, I go in, I get drugged. And, I, and <laughs> as, I, as I come out of my drug-induced coma, I read that Michael Avenatti has been arrested. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I, I thought to myself, that. this can't be happening. Like, I, like <laughs> on the same day they released the Mueller report, Michael He's... Avenatti has been arrested for running the stupidest scam in legitimately all of human history. Those were great and he's getting and he's getting, and he's getting <laughs> that didn't really on. happen, right? <laughs> he's getting dunked on by Stormy Daniels, right? Who's saying, yeah, he was a crappy, who's a crappy lawyer. And I, I legitimately woke up and I thought, like Michael Jackson, I died of a propofol. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on. And here. don't forget, it's not so Avenatti, who was on CNN and MSNBC 108 times between last March and last May. 108. 108 times. times. Avenatti goes down, frequent CNN guest. His co-conspirator is Mark Garagos, <laughs> the CNN legal analyst. He goes down in the scheme. And then I'm reading, I'm literally just reading the news as I'm on the air. <laughs> and I see this little underreported story. The world's fastest melting glacier. We're getting ready for the Green New Deal vote. The world's fastest melting glacier on Monday stopped melting and started <laughs> gaining ice. Global warming itself ended this week. It, it, it's oh. like if Franklin Graham from the president's <laughs> inauguration, Mr. President, God has blessed us with rain just as you started to speak. <laughs> Mr. President, God stop global warming <laughs> just as you were being you know what exonerated. I like the, you know what I love about the Michael Avenatti story, though? You know, everything? They, they, yeah, they, everything. The but, they, but they hit Trump on being associated with Michael Cohen, a fair hit. You shouldn't associate with guys like Michael Cohen. Right? <laughs> right. He's a slime, right? True. My, but they associated with Michael Avenatti. They mm-hmm. love this guy. Bill Maher said, oh, he's Donald Trump's worst nightmare. If that's Donald Trump's worst nightmare, <laughs> I'm the queen of Romania. Was, you know? By the way, that, that, that quote from him, I mean, it was so perfect. The writers of the season are just... <laughs> they're doing great work. They, they, and, and they plant these clues like a season <laughs> earlier and then they come to fruition. I mean, it really, like the real payoffs, yeah. right? He like, goes on The View and he says, all my fantasies involve handcuffs. Yeah. <laughs> and then he ends up yeah, being yeah. arrested. I thought and, that was and he's, and he's, he's arrested for trying to bully Nike, right? The company of Colin Kaepernick. Mm-hmm. And he's trying yep. to bully them. What is it also with these lawyers pretending to be gangsters? You say what you will about gangsters. They're gangsters. They're really <laughs> dangerous characters. When they threaten you, you're afraid, right? Yeah. These guys come and say, Nike, I'm going to take you down. Oh, I'm going to tweet like, Nike. Look, <laughs> the, the thing about, here's the thing about that. Michael Avenatti knows he can get on CNN. That's why he was able to do that, right? The, right. the, the part of that story that uh, is underreported yeah, is that when he good says, point. I'll take your market cap down a billion dollars, what he means by that is I will go on CNN tonight with all of my friends like Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo, and I will talk very bad things about your company. Yeah. That's what he meant, and he knows he can do that and because Brian, he's on speed dial with the producers and at CNN. Brian Stelter said to him, I, I take you seriously as a presidential candidate because you've been on cable news so much. That's what he mm-hmm. said to him. You know, so they, they build him up. They actually are talking about him as a presidential candidate. One thing you got to say about Trump, he never talked about Michael Cohen running for president. <laughs> the president did that with Michael Avenatti. Alicia, we want to hear from a few more of our Daily Wire subscribers. After all, they pay for my house by going over to dailywire.com slash subscribe and becoming annual subscribers. You too can help me pay my mortgage. And if you do it <laughs> during this broadcast, you will be entered automatically for a chance to win uh, a trip to LA uh, to, you know, sit in and Watch us do whatever this thing is. What, do. what are we doing? So, Alicia, what are they? Uh, what are our subscribers asking us right oh, now? Oh, I'm real glad you didn't ask me. What are we doing? Because none of us have that answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> no <chance. laughs> Before we get to those awesome subscriber questions that make it possible for all of us to be stuck here, me and you know a non-smoke filled room. So, thanks for that, guys. Uh, we do have our Facebook polling results. Turns out that people think that The Economist uh, having to apologize to Ben and change their headline got 7% of the vote about the craziest slash greatest news week ever. Jesse Smollett comes in at 10%. The Green New Deal utterly failing and no Democrats voting for it came in at 23%. But of course, the Mueller report showing absolutely no collusion. You know, either Trump is a really 
super secret Russian spy or he's really dumb. Democrats can't have it both ways. 60% of the people say that the Mueller report results showing no collusion with Russia is the story of the week. I can't yeah. believe that uh, our Daily Wire uh, audience could be so wrong. <laughs> Clearly, The Economist having mm -hmm. to apologize to Ben today is the biggest news story of the week. This was so, the first thing I saw this morning. This, this, it was trending on Twitter. It, yep. was tr it was trending on Twitter. Ben, who writes a book about philosophy without his picture on the cover. So, like, a guaranteed three copies sold to your grandmother, <laughs> yeah. uh, each one autographed for her friends. Uh, <laughs> Ben made the num New York Times number one best-selling book in the country uh, this week, unseating Michelle Obama, who's held on to that number one spot with her uh, becoming second place book. That's what I'm calling it. <laughs> <laughs> her becoming book. Uh, for the last minute. And then The Economist does what I actually think, in fairness, was quite a nice The interview was good. Yeah, the interview nice was interview. good. I thought so, too. Yeah, I didn't mind the interview at all. And then, and then they, they tweet out the story today under the headline. Uh, you'll get it right. Ben Shapiro the alt-right sage without the rage. Which is wrong in two ways, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised you didn't say three, but yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, but, yeah right. but yeah, the, the alt-right, man. And I was, I was like, really? It's the like, yarmulke with the with? swastika on it. That's mm -hmm. yeah, like, this is where they're going. Like, do they not have, there's a, there, there's a company, it's called Google. And when you type things into the Google machine, it tells you things about people. So if you typed in Ben Shapiro alt-right, the first results would have been me ripping the alt-right in the Washington Post. Right. And probably the second results would have been me doing an entire episode ripping the alt-right on my show. Then it would and be the alt-right ripping you. Right, then it would be the alt-right ripping me. I've spent the last four years doing open war with the alt-right. If they had bothered to do a control F inside my book, I referenced the alt-right four times. All four times I called them racist pieces of crap. So this seemed to be a bit odd. And so, yeah. I, t I mean, I never go to war with media people who attack me because I get attacked a lot, as it turns out. This one I was not going to stand for. So no, I, I really no. went after them on Twitter. I mean, I, I, I called, I, I, did, I said, you need to apologize. You need to pull this down. You need to change the title. I said, I, I threatened to get a solicitor really? in Britain because the, because the libel laws in Britain yeah. are a lot looser than the libel laws here. So they're yeah, going to play by those rules. And when people call you Nazis, you probably uh, yeah, you have a good libel. Have, uh, yeah, yeah libel exactly. Case. And so within four hours, they pulled down the original headline. They changed the, now I'm a radical conservative. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer the alt-right <laughs> sage without the They defended it first, though. They defended their headline as long as they could. And then I guess they didn't want to lawyer up, so they changed it. Yeah, so, yeah, something happened and they decided to change. And then they issued a full apology. They said, we, that, as it turns out, Ben Shapiro is a longtime critic of the alt right. We apologize, and they spelled it with an S, which just shows what jerks they are. Oh, man. They probably put a U in color. It's ridiculous. Unbelievable. It is amazing, though, because I, I thought about this morning how they could have come to such a patently absurd conclusion. And then I realized it's because the left, and particularly the left media, is so ensconced in their ideological bubble that they legitimately cannot discern the difference yeah. between the right and the alternative to the right which is the alt-right, They, from their point of view, we are all white supremacists, Nazi, mm -hmm. racist, violent, uh, anti-Semitic, jingoistic, you I, know, I one actually, step away from I murder. I think that conflation is one of the most dangerous things in public life. And the reason that I say that is because of what it conveys and also the view that it springs from. So what it conveys is that if you are on the right, if you have a heterodox opinion, you're a Nazi. We can't talk with you, and presumably you should be banned, because Facebook in the last couple of days has mm -hmm. said that they are no longer going to allow you to post anything that's white nationalist or white supremacist. I hate white nationalism. I hate white supremacy. Turns out they don't like me much either, but I am deeply uncomfortable with the idea of Facebook using data from Media Matters and the SPLC to really? determine really? which speech should be banned. Also, like, the, this, thing, this, the thing is, you and Jordan Peterson, there's not much to go after you about. You know, I mean, you're not a racist. You're not, obviously not a white. But they always go after you on this uh, transgender thing. Here's a thing that didn't exist like two years ago. I mean, sudden, and suddenly this is the worst thing they can say about also, you. Also, it's called biology. The, the, the truth is, the, wrong the real reason they're pissed, really, is because if you look at the people that Jordan speaks to largely, it is young men who are dispossessed, and he is trying to make them better. Right. Right. And if you look at my audience, which is actually pretty diverse, it is very young, and it is very large. And that means that if I am trying to teach people to be better, then all they have to do is point out people mm -hmm. who are not better and say, this is probably your crowd even though it obviously is, is not my crowd. But the real problem I have is, again, that conflation is an attempt to write conservatism into Nazism and then toss it right, out the window. And the view right. that that comes from is such a perverse view of what Western civilization is. And this brings me to the Joe Biden quote that I think mm -hmm. is one of the worst quotes I've seen from a political candidate yeah. in, in a decade. Yeah. When J Joe Biden said at a rally in front of, I think it was a racial minority crowd, uh, he, he said something to the effect of English jurisprudence is white culture. And I thought to myself... And, and should be... And, and we have and to get past it. And he needs to change. And 
I thought, first of all, English jurisprudence is Anglo-American jurisprudence is one of the best things that has ever happened to humanity, to humanity and particularly right. yeah. to minorities, because it turns out that Anglo-American jurisprudence is about the rights of the individual. You know who don't have a lot of minority rights? People who are living in non-Anglo-American jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. right? Those people tend to be charged head taxes. Those people tend to be victimized along yeah. racial and religious lines. Right. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. But for the left, for the hard left, like Joe Biden or for the intersectional left, Western civilization is a veneer. Right? It's a, it's a post-facto post intellectual veneer that we put on power relations. And what Western civilization really is, is white people cramming down their viewpoints on everybody else and then giving some sort of post-facto justification with a bunch of nice, pretty words about freedom of speech and well, equality know. under law. And so if we just tear down that Western civilization, then the hierarchy will go along too. That is exactly the same thing that the alt-right actually says, except they like Western civilization. They say, that they like the power hierarchy in which white people are more powerful than everybody else. All the nice words about freedom and free markets and all that stuff, that's a bunch of crap that we say just to just to sweeten the tea a little bit. But the real tea is white supremacy, yeah. and we like the white supremacy. So you're suggesting so, that the two alternatives to the right, the alt-right and the left, agree that the right is wrong. I want to talk more about this. I also want to finally get to those questions <laughs> that we promised we were going to take from our uh, dailywire.com subscribers. But first, we have a special guest. We promised that one day this would happen. That he that from uh, his lofty perch on the American <laughs> East Coast, Matt Walsh would descend uh, and deign to spend a little time with us here. People ask for this all the time on Twitter. They're like, "Oh, I don't want to, where's Matt Walsh? Uh, the Daily Wire guys get together and there's no Matt Walsh. Uh, Jeremy grew up here just so that we wouldn't notice that Matt Walsh wasn't on the show. But we today are demonstrating our great uh, power." because we got Matt Walsh to come join the show. No, the host not. of the Matt Walsh Show. If you aren't familiar with the show, you're missing out. Here's some clips. Hey guys, over on the Matt Walsh Show today. Was Jesus a socialist? No, you nitwits. He was not a socialist. Bernie Sanders is an arrogant, power-hungry, hypocritical, cowardly, morally deranged communist. They're gonna chemically castrate this boy. He is being physically, psychologically, emotionally abused. Some old tweets from Cory Booker. Sleep and I broke up a few nights ago. I'm dating coffee now. She's hot. <laughs> The Green New Deal is finally here. It's the kind of thing that would sound brilliant if you were high. That around half of all millennials find socialism appealing. They want daddy in Washington to supplant daddy at home. I think Cory Booker might have a condition, actually. I'm kind of worried about him. Someone should probably check on him. Matt Walsh, hey. thanks for being with us. Right. Finally. You just appeared like that. That was crazy. Wow. <laughs> it was a long drive to get here, but I'm, I'm here. Finally. How many wait. episodes did you shoot in transit? <laughs> I, I, I got quite a few of them done, so now, now I'm here. You didn't so, wear your bathing suit. My, I, I well, got an I email. I, I was told this was spring break edition. <laughs> it was Catholic bathing suit day. It was Catholic bathing suit day. No, that is, that is too short for Catholics. That's yeah. way, too, way too skimpy. I need like a big alb or something. Yeah. That's right. It's so, actually great because he's sitting between me and he's the only person more dour than I am. <laughs> and you and he's the only person more Catholic than you are. So, so there's kind of a transition here. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, Matt, we were just talking about uh, the, the conflation of all conservatives with the alt-right. And... Uh, how the alt-right and the left actually agree broadly on identity politics. They just disagree about who the victor uh, should be. What, what makes us different than the alt-right? Well, I, I mean, I'm sitting here next to the leader of the alt-right, which is kind of, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is pretty fun. Um, from what I could tell, the, the main thing that jumps out at me about the alt-right is that it's very nihilistic. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's identity politics, yes, but at the core of it, there doesn't appear to be much of a moral core and so for me conservatism should be should have that moral foundation that moral core uh, which is also what makes the alt-right related to the alt-left and that at the end of the day it's relativistic it's nihilistic mm. um, it's you know your truth is whatever your truth is I, I think they both share that foundation Michael you wrote one of the earliest pieces sort of exposing the reality of the alt-right I think to a mainstream uh, audience and one of the things that you touched on in that piece was the sort of religiosity of the alt-right and how it's uh, a religiosity without any connection to the spiritual truths of religion? It's, yeah, it's very postmodern. And this is an issue I really wanted to get out and explain what the alt right was when that phrase had meaning, which it no longer does because Ben Shapiro is now the leader of the alt right. Of, <laughs> yeah. and anyone to the right of Hillary Clinton is. They do this to a lot of words racism, sexism, blah, 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 and they've done it to the alt right. But it does have a meaning, and it's an alternative 
to what we would call the conservative tradition. And it's an alternative that emphasizes brutal power politics. It's, an, it's a zero-sum game. It's rooted essentially in racial identity. And the, the trouble with it, as the trouble with so many of these things, is that it inverts reality. You know, Andrew Breitbart, who everyone in L.A. knew except for me because I got out here too late, uh, would talk about how politics is down from culture, and culture, as Russell Kirk says, is down from religion, from the cult. What they do is they invert that, and so they substitute, rather than talking about recreating Christendom, re recreating Western civilization, rooted in the religion that forms that, they say, no, 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 we want all the trappings of Christendom yeah. without the Christ. Mm -hmm. They want all the trappings of Western culture without the cult that makes the culture. That, that actually it, is leftism. It is leftism. <laughs> well, it reminds me. It's like the sort of people who drink decaf coffee and Diet Coke. They, want, <laughs> they eat vegetarian bacon. They want the semblance of the thing, but they don't want the essence of the thing. And I, I, that's what the alt-right does. So they use the sort of language that might get some conservatives excited. We need to go back to our foundations. We need to go back to Western civilization. But they misunderstand what Western civilization is essentially, probably because they haven't read the, the alt-right leader's <laughs> book on uh, the right side of history. You know, if you can get past uh, the aesthetic long enough to take Michael seriously, he <laughs> yeah. really knows a lot of stuff. No, no, no. That's not a recent case. <laughs> You know, there was one time. There was one time on on the show. I, I we were talking about sort of debates among Protestants and Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, all these things. And we were in this really intense debate. And I realized it was Halloween, and I was wearing a Moana costume. And I said, this, is not, this isn't great video. Can we talk about Jesse Smollett? Oh, can we not talk? about it? <laughs> It's the it, to me in a week of great stories. It is the greatest. It story. is the most fun story. It is like, the most I, fun I mean, story. because. There's a Schroedenfreude to the Mueller report. That, like two years in the making. It's a long windup, and when the pitch comes, it's really great. But the the Jesse Smollett being let off the hook for being a racial hoaxer, and now his lawyer maintaining that he was in fact innocent. He was the victim of a hate crime from two Nigerian brothers, who he, in in his employ, in his employ, his personal trainers who were extras on Empire, who beat him up, and now his lawyers are saying that they legitimately beat him up while wearing white face. <laughs> under the, their ski masks. Under their ski masks. This is, the, <laughs> this is the actual theory of the case. And I just think, this timeline is freaking great, man. I mean, this is a great. And Michelle Obama's friends are calling up the DA yeah. over there and telling her, can you kick this thing? And she's like, sure. And I'll pretend to accuse myself, but I won't. And no, then that, that was still only meant in the colloquial sense. In the colloquial mm -hmm. sense, because that's what lawyers do. We speak in the colloquial sense. <laughs> when I'm lawyering, what I always do when I write a contract is I say, I make it as colloquial as I can. Hey, y'all. <laughs> right, exactly. Can we do some stuff here? Like, you'll do some stuff, I'll do some stuff, we'll be happy. That's how I write all my contracts. Ben always says, hey, y'all, hey, in parentheses. <laughs> Party one. Party, party one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things I've always, the, why corruption always makes me laugh is because when it gets as corrupt as Chicago, they stop hiding it. It's they, so funny. They, mm -hmm. they, you know, it's just like, what did you do with the money? Well, I put it in a little tin box kind of thing, right. you know? And, and now, the Chicago, the thing about this Smollett story is nobody is clean. You know, you want to root for the cops. I love the cops. They're, you know, our first responders and all this stuff. But the cops in Chicago have been very, have not been so good. Before this new guy came in, you know, they yeah. hid that video Laquan of Laquan McDonald getting shot. Uh, they hid it for something like 13 months. Rahm uh, Emanuel was part of that. And that's the reason this woman who dumped the case is in office, basically. Right. She came in saying they're not treating black people. So it's like, it's basically bad Democrats versus evil Democrats. But when you're too corrupt for a guy who legitimately used to send fish in newspaper to his enemies <laughs> when he was on the Hill, Rahm Emanuel, yeah. you may have you, gone a little over the too rain. far. Yeah. You're, you're like, you're past the rainbow. Over the rainbow the left you behind a while ago. The, the unmentioned part of this, though, because once he got off the hook, once they said, okay, you're not guilty. Although you're, they kept the money. Yeah, yeah. You're not guilty. Give us that 10 Gs and you have to go do some work for Jesse Jackson's nonprofit. Okay. But, retroactively. <laughs> retroactively, but you're off the hook. But in, initially we heard, oh, Empire is going to hire him back. He's going to come back on. He's going to have a career. Everyone is forgetting the federal charges that could be brought against him for sending a hate hoax through the mail Matt, with will, white powder. Will they bring federal charges? Uh, I, I mean, I certainly hope so, although they didn't say that he's not guilty because they, that's right. the thing is right. the, the prosecutors out there saying that he's guilty. The, Kim Fox said that, yeah, well, we think he's guilty. The charges made sense. So... They're not making any attempt to hide it. That's that's what really is kind of scary about it. So it shows you something about how privilege really works in our society. Um, and it's not necessarily tied to being white, straight, and male, apparently, as Jesse Smollett has shown us, <laughs> or as Cardi B has shown us. Um, uh, you know, it's it's 
privilege that has a lot more to do with, well, certainly money is, is the first thing that matters, but um, also, you know, identity, the, the trendiest identity is not white and male, as we've and, discovered. And connections. Celebrity yeah. status. Yeah. Celebrity yeah. status helps yeah. an awful lot, right? Joseph Ep Epstein down in Florida getting off on, on right. his charges on, uh, I mean, that guy should be in jail forever yeah. and for, never for get out. For 100% of time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, that, I, I, honestly, I'll be honest, I, I'm really looking forward to them finally breaking all the people who vid visited his sex slave island and all of their activities. I want all this stuff out in the public because I want to know what Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I'm, I'm just going to head Joseph's out of here, guys, yeah. before that story breaks. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Nobody ever invited you to any <laughs> I think part, part of the problem, too, is that um, there's so little integrity on either side of the aisle anymore. So that's how people get away with things is that they always have their own side that's going to overlook it. because, And it happens on, it happens on the other side, too. So that, that's, that's part of the problem is that the peanut gallery, who should be demanding justice, hmm. uh, we're always looking at things through a political lens. And so now the left is looking at Jesse Smollett and saying, well, I guess he's kind of ours, and so we have to sort of yeah, at least that, look the other way. It was and, that thing that the, that the black community said after O.J. Simpson. I realize that's a yeah. long time ago. No, but they did but where they that. basically said, you owe us one. Yeah. Like, we know he's guilty, but you just owe us one. And I feel like that's one of the problems with identity politics, yes, on both sides of the aisle, is that we, we tend to want this sort of... Um, broad sense of, of justice, like a correction against broad injustice, but there can't be broad justice without individual instances yeah. of justice. Time you can't only, get to justice time through only injustice. It goes one way, you know, and once it's over, yeah. you can't do a thing about it. You can't correct slavery. You can't punish right. a guy just because he's white for holding slaves, which he never held. It just doesn't work that way. And the, the left frequently thinks without time, as, like with abortion, when they say, oh, well, that's not really a person. You think like, Yes, it is. It's a person at a certain time in this time that is his life. And I think that the left does this mm. all the time. They just eliminate the uh, dimension of time when they think. Because how can, you, how can you recompense people who are dead? You can't. That's what injustice is. So this is a legitimate question for you guys about Jesse Smollett. Uh, I, I referenced O.J. And one of the most interesting things to me about O.J. is that he didn't get away with anything. Mm. Right? He, he got away in the moment. But there is a kind of justice, a supernatural justice that seems to exist uh, on Earth, and in the act of getting away with it, I think uh, O.J. Simpson was so not only not only corrupted because he's a murderer, but uh, corrupted by the idea of his own invulnerability in the face of the law, that it led him to do other terrible things, which eventually caught up with him. Will will a similar justice track Jesse Smollett at some point? Well, the problem is he's going to need publicity for something else, because if he just mm. disappears into the ether, and the last we hear of him is this nonsense, then he's never going to get hired again. You know, maybe, although I will say that the nice thing, O.J. was never, he was, he was in Hollywood, but he really was not of, of Hollywood. Hollywood yeah. I mean, just, Jesse Smollett is a Hollywood person, which means that everybody gets a second shot in Hollywood. Five years from now, Jordan Peele will cast him in a movie or something, and it'll just be kind of a big joke that he did this five years ago, and we'll all laugh about it, and they will be like, oh, well, isn't that funny that now he's back doing this sort of stuff. He's, although you have to be pretty crazy to do what he did, so maybe that'll catch up with him. You know, well, he may, he may, he's a self-destructive human. I mean, that's, yeah, that's absolutely I mean, true. When you, when you believe that everyone believes your lie, I mean, it's pretty audacious to have the police say you're guilty, the mayor say you're guilty, even the prosecutor who just dropped the charges say you're guilty, and the court keep, <laughs> keep the bail money. Yeah. And then your press conference isn't, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, I'm very glad, obviously, that I'm not facing worse charges. <laughs> but instead, you're... No, I was a victim. I was always telling the truth. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to face my well, mama but, if I had but, been but alive. That's, that's, you, you, you talk like someone who's never met an actor, which I know. <laughs> but, but, this is, but it's actually true of everybody, right? I mean, brazening it out is always the is always the best thing to do in modern politics and and yeah, anywhere in modern life. Right? I mean, we talked about mm -hmm. this a couple of episodes ago. In this, the graceless society. In the graceless society, if you were to apologize, then it'd be like, okay, he can't work again, mm -hmm. right? Because then he's acknowledged his guilt. But if he never acknowledges his guilt, then he can continue to maintain that he was beat up by two Nigerian brothers in whiteface. Under their ski masks. Right, which, under, under their ski masks. I mean, my, my going theory of the case, by the way, is that it wasn't the Nigerian brothers at all. It was Ralph Northam in blackface in whiteface. <laughs> <laughs> which is why I, I think, uh, I, I have no problem with them dropping the charges. All they had to do, I, I thought that that would actually be the best case scenario, is if they dropped the charges on the condition that he go out on the courthouse steps and admit what he did. Mm. Right. And then yeah. that's no problem. Then they can say, yeah, you're fine. We, we, because... If, even if they had given him two weeks of jail time, cares, something right. like that, yeah, and, and he could maintain yeah. his innocence, then he still wins in some respect. So that's what makes this such a travesty, is that if they want to claim, oh, well, it wasn't worth going through the whole rigmarole of a trial, fine, I get that. So then tell him that he needs to go. The fact that you let him go out on the courthouse steps 
and 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 claim innocence is yeah. is what makes this such a tragedy. And the fact that they sealed the court records means we don't even they, know they the deal that they, they did. You, well, did you see what Kim Fox said about that? She said we accidentally applied to have oh, the court oh, records yeah, sealed. Right. She, she right. said we're now the applying Chicago, to have them unsealed. Chicago uh -huh. way, yeah, <laughs> sure. But, yeah, you know, it's like Al Capone, saying, gun just went off. They were saying that this best week ever with all this crazy news. This the Jussie Smollett thing. That was why I was a little too bad because that was injustice. He got off the hook. No way. What are you? T that's the that's a little cherry on top of the Sunday because now it's such a gross injustice. Yeah. There is a chance that the feds look into this, look into both how he got his deal and look into the fake uh, hate mail hoax. But also Republicans get to point to this as such an egregious example of, of hoaxes and identity politics gone wrong. Well, we can use this for two years. Did you say the media coverage of Smollett has been hysterically funny. Like Brian Stelter, the ombudsman over at <laughs> CNN yeah. doing reliable source. He gets on TV after all this happens, and he goes, we may never know what happened with Jesse Smollett. <laughs> we, because no one was there. I wasn't there. You weren't there. We may never know what happened with Jesse Smollett. Weird, because for two years, your entire network was proclaiming that President Trump was a cat's paw of the Russians. <laughs> and and also, you had no evidence, and it turned out to be false. We have this way and you of still want to apologize out. for that. We have this way of finding out called a trial. <laughs> you know, the, reason, the reason we don't also, know is this Chicago's doofus corrupt. signed a personal check <laughs> yeah. to the people who committed a hate crime against him and called them on the phone an hour before it happened. Yeah. How many times have you been hate crimed over that sort of <laughs> Guys, thing? he didn't drop the Subway sandwich. <laughs> we have all the proof we need. That, that, that those, by the those, way, is the best. Those, that, that will never die. That, those, is, that is the best part of the those story. Those are good sandwiches. Not, they're good well, sandwiches. You don't want to let go of your Subway sandwich. Uh, I, I, I got to say that if Subway does not hire him <laughs> for a commercial campaign after this, they've really missed their opportunity. I mean, if their two spokespeople are not Jared and, Jess, and Jesse, I mean, that's it's pretty fantastic. So, Alicia, while we've got Matt here, let's uh, see if any of our Daily Wire subscribers have questions that he might know the answer to. Uh, Lord knows we do not. <laughs> Alicia, Alicia. Uh, oh, sorry. You guys didn't even give me a working umbrella? <laughs> Dear Lord. There's not even a working sun where you are. <laughs> I mean, well, I don't know. It's a good thing there's no working sun because you don't pay me enough to get Botox. So, yeah. all righty. That's true. <laughs> this question, I guess it's for all the guys. Charles wants to know, what would be your advice to somebody who yearns for the freedom of the world of philosophical commentary, but also wishes to keep the security of a full-time job they consider a bore <laughs> and mundane? <laughs> hmm. Give, well, give up that dream. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he didn't know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the problem these days. Is if you uh, and that's what makes it easier. You know, people say to me all the time, like, "Well, how do you have the courage to speak your mind?" Given that, well, it's easy for me because it's my job to be a loudmouth and have opinions. Um, and uh, we're all in the same boat. Our job is is opinions, but it's a lot harder when you have a real job. And, and then you're trying to balance that and being, you know, the prudence of when do I speak up. Um, so that's a, a much more difficult thing, uh, which is why I think people that are in the opinion realm would get way too much credit, I think, for being warriors for truth when really it's, it's, this is what we do. This so. is definitely true. I will also say that everybody, I think underlying that question is how do I get into sort of the opinion business? And the answer is you do a lot of stuff for free for a very long time. Mm. Yeah. I mean, really, like everybody sort of wants to go to immediately Charles Crowd Hammer status where just you're, you're on Fox News every night or how did you get where you are? How'd you this? I'm in year 18 of this project. I'm 35 years old, so I look, you know, somewhat young at this point still. I've been doing this for nearly two decades yeah. Yeah. and for and, nearly no pay for most of that time. And you also you also acquired an expertise first. You you are a Harvard lawyer. You've had a varied career in show business. I have no idea what Noel Yeah, did. well, the real way to do it <laughs> is to not write a book. I mean, I hate to disagree with you. This fellas. is actually an interesting because, you know, I like to bring in a little business advice for how people might be able to make themselves successful. So I like a question like this. You bring up working for free. One of the amazing things that you will hear people say routinely, especially young people, is I know my value. I know what I'm worth. You'll say, hey, I mean, if you want to write something for us, submit it and we'll review it. And if we like it, we'll wear it. And I don't write for free. I know my value. I know, I know my worth. I do too. <laughs> I offered it to you. you. You have no worth. You have no value. Your time is not automatically valuable. The fact that you typed into a computer does not create value for me. V value is when I can take what you've created and I can monetize it in some way that brings in money. And then I can keep some of that money and I can give some of the money to you. That's the definition of value. And in order to gain value as a commentator, you have to write a lot of commentary. It's when, when people in Hollywood, people will tell me they want to move to Hollywood. They'll say, you know, in my hometown, I'm an actor. Uh, acting is my dream, so I want to move to Hollywood. 
And I'll say, well, you have the wrong dream. Because when you move to Hollywood, the first thing that happens is you stop acting. Mm. You, could do, you could do high-end uh, uh, regional theater or community theater in your hometown, uh, some of it very good. And you could probably act in six shows a year if you're, if you're worth your salt back where you are. You move to LA, you may not act for years. 75 auditions to book a role is mm -hmm. basically the average for an actor in Hollywood. And the role might be one line one day. Same with musicians. People will say, you know, I, I have this band. We play in bars all around my hometown. Uh, my, my passion is playing music, so I'm going to move to L.A. or Nashville and make it. I say, well, you have the wrong dream. You play music where you are. Moving to Nashville is a way to not play music yeah. anymore because they don't pay you 200 bucks to play in a restaurant in Nashville because everyone in Nashville plays music. The, the market is saturated. Uh, they do pay you that in your small town. And even if they did in Nashville, you couldn't live off the 200 bucks the way you can in your small town. Mm -hmm. your, your actual ambition is misstated. What you really mean, but you don't want to say because it sounds terrible, is I, I would rather act less, I would rather play music less for the opportunity to, to gain a higher level of recognition or to play at a higher level with better people or play on a greater stage with a greater, a greater audience. But that, that sounds... You know, people don't like to say honest yeah. things about themselves. And so they say, oh, my dream is acting or my dream is... Stay where you are. Yeah. It, and, and at the end of the day, what it takes to be a musician is playing music. And what it takes to be an actor is acting. What it takes to be a commentator is commentating. And over time... And you learning develop, things. And, and learning reading, things. Yeah. And, and getting good at this. this is right. what, you develop it, skill and you... I will say that the YouTube culture has really hurt us in this way because there are people who somehow sort of stardom without ever having done anything or learned anything. And listen, when I was younger, the dues paying stuff pissed me oh, off. Oh, yeah, of course. Really pissed me off yeah. because I knew I was more talented than half the people that I was watching. I knew that I knew more stuff than they did. And I felt it was a grave injustice that I was not getting more recognition for the fact that my writing was, was very good and that I'd really studied these issues. But the fact is that that required me to put in more time and the world didn't owe me anything. And the same thing, I feel like, I mean, Drew, how many scripts have you written and how many have actually made it to screen? Oh, my, you know, I wrote, I, wrote, I think, four novels before I published one. And, and, very, and, and though the thing about screenwriting is you can make a good living without ever having them get to screen, almost none of the screenplays I sold for good money made it to the screen. I mean, that's yeah. the movie business. I, I even want to puncture the, one of the great dreams that I get asked this question at every campus speech because I actually did get paid a ton of money to do nothing. I actually, like literally nothing, right? You, now you're a number one New York Times bestselling author, so that does hit above, you know. But this was a number one bestselling blank book. I worked for, from the age of 18 to, I don't know, when did I do the book, 27 or something? Mm -hmm. I worked for Peanuts all that time. I worked a million political campaigns. I did a ton of off, 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 off Broadway plays for making pennies, and it, the only thing that keeps you going through that is because you want to do the thing, because you want to write yeah, the right. columns, because you want to write the books, because you want to be in it, you want to do plays. You got to do it for that. If you think you're going to get a payday for it, I, I mean, keep I want, I want to challenge people, people used to interview me when I started to hit it big and get big money for novels, and they would say, "Well, you really made a lot of money." I said, "We've got to prorate it. We got to prorate it." <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> right. We prorated exactly over all the things right. I wrote. I mean, for, for years, thing, I, so I've been writing a syndicated column since I was 17 years old. Mm. It started to make any sort of money that would even look like money in the last three years, mm. maybe. Right. So, it, and, but, and but I want to challenge even this thing. You said, you know, it's kind of unfortunate we live in the age of YouTube and people can legitimately become superstars who've done nothing. And it is true. And it's always been true in every medium. Right. Some guy scratches out nothing on the page <laughs> and it becomes a, a best-selling book. I mean, that, that's a tale as old But as that's time. not the norm. I mean, that's not, not a only, But not only is it not the norm, you, you, as you famously have said, luck is not a business model. Yep. Right. But there is more to it which is they may attain a small measure of, of fame, a large measure of fame, rapidly on the basis of nothing, but they won't preserve this fame right. on the basis of nothing. And a great example of this uh, is, is Logan Paul. Mm. So Logan Paul and his brother are YouTube stars. Uh, Logan Paul, I'm not a connoisseur of this content. <laughs> as far as I can tell, he became very, very famous for doing very, very dumb things while a camera was rolling. <laughs> and you look at him, and he makes like six hundred quadrillion dollars. He has a staff of Logan Paul and his buddies. They live in a giant mansion and it is manna from heaven and beautiful women rain down upon them. And you wonder like, how is such a thing possible? It seems like an injustice. This week, Logan Paul put out a video 
a documentary of his examination of the flat earth conspiracy theory, which is as good as any comedy film made in the last decade. It's a 50 minute feature. The production value, unbelievable. The skill, the, the directing, the editing, the performance. His performance is subtle, it's self-deprecating, it's, it's brilliantly conceived. It took stones uh, the size <laughs> of beach balls to actually put himself in the environments that he did in order to, to create this piece of, of entertainment. And what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is Logan Paul may have gotten famous for filming himself do stupid things, and he may have ridden a wave that seems from the outside to be kind of unfair. He has maintained his level of fame. He and many, many, Pootie Pie and yeah, others who, right. mm-hmm. who have created enormous brands, creating a brand, difficult maintaining a brand, nearly impossible, well, I mean, he also, improving your brand. He also generates unheard. an insane amount of content. I mean, that's right. We, I mean, spoiler alert, we've met Logan Paul, and another spoiler alert, he called me a mother bleeping G. Which <laughs> yeah, was yeah, a yeah, really yeah. interesting experience. But, but, but Logan Paul told me, because I, I asked him, what's your daily schedule? I asked this to kind of everybody famous yeah. who comes by, what's your daily schedule? And he said, well, I have a camera on me for 10 hours a day, and then we spend seven hours at night editing. That's right. He works 17 hours a day. I think that's one of the, that is one of the great things that we talk about paying your dues and everything, but uh, these days, you could cut out the middleman, and if you do mm-hmm. have talent, you can just go right to the you can go right to the people. And there are there are some people who you know I, I tend to think if you do manage to attract a huge audience, uh, that probably means that you have some sort of of talent uh, because there are a billion people on the internet trying to do it. That's right. And so if you manage to do it, it probably means that that, that you've got something going on. So it is it is different now. You know, the, the paying your dues thing I think looks a little bit different than it used to. It, it is also a matter of investment. Meaning that what, what I see a lot is people who don't actually want to invest either their time or their money. They want you to invest your time and your money yeah. in them. And that's not a thing. Yeah. Okay, either you got to invest an enormous amount of time getting so good at the thing that I cannot turn down the opportunity to give you my money. Yeah. Or you have to put in your own money and risk. I mean, you want the reward. you got to take the risk. That's right. Well, stuff like this is a huge risk. You know, that's the thing with artists and anybody who does a creative job. You're risking your life. You're right. risking your whole life. Because most people who do this stuff, are smart enough to have done something much safer. You know, you, you could have been a lawyer. I mean, you could have done, you know. I, I did, I worked right, at a law firm. Right, and, yeah. and, and, that's, and that's the thing. Most of them are putting aside a, a way of life and taking this incredible risk with your whole life. You can wind up, and I've seen it happen to people, you can wind up 50 with nothing. You know, well, this is why I, not, I will not say... Not me, boys. It was smooth sailing all the way here <laughs> and absolutely nothing else that I'm qualified to do on Earth. Listen, if you would like to come and sit in on a live taping of a show where we recommend Logan Paul feature films, <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome to head over to dailywire.com. There's a little bit of time left during this live broadcast where if you click on subscribe, become an annual subscriber, you'll be automatically entered for an opportunity to do just that. We'll uh, pay for you a flight or an Uber to come down uh, to our studios here in L.A., and we'll light you up a nice cigar and let you sit in with us while we film a future episode of Backstage. Alicia, for those who are already subscribers and able to ask us questions, they uh, able to get a Leftist Tears Hot or Cold Tumblr if they're annual subscribers. They're able to tune in daily to the Matt Walsh Show, the Andrew Clavin Show, the Michael Knowles Show, or the Ben Shapiro Show, and to our radio uh, show behind our paywall. Uh, they may also want to, you know, just ask us something. Do they? Oh, I do have a question, though. After seeing that wide shot, now that Michael Knowles is closer to that mm-hmm. camera, he once asked me for my waxer, and I thought it was for <laughs> his mm-hmm. wife. Yeah. It's no, very no. apparent it was for his very own legs, and listen, now I am mortified. I, listen, I know that transgenderism is becoming the <laughs> oh, new God. dominant theme. And listen, <laughs> no. I'm just saying there aren't a lot of roles in Hollywood for men. Half the roles are for women. Why wouldn't I leave myself available for that? <laughs> Make it stop. Make it we've, stop. We've hit a new love. Yeah. Oh, God. Joe frickin' name it, though. <laughs> Hopefully we can end on a high note and tell Sam where he can go for the most conservative vacation spot, considering that this is a very special spring break edition. Mm, Matt? <laughs> Uh, the, the best vacation spot? Yeah, the Vatican. Uh, yeah, I, I've been living in my car for 32 years. I don't, I don't go on vacation, so I don't know, Six Flags? I mean, I've got the most conservative vacation spot. Yes. Waikiki Beach 
in the, for some reason it's a state of Hawaii, <laughs> yeah. this is the most conservative thing. Because one, it's beautiful. It's almost entirely man-made on that yeah. beach. It is so gorgeous. Everything has been manicured perfectly for you. You've got steakhouses. You've got the Cheesecake Factory. You've got every single beautiful comfort you want. No driving, no nothing. They hand you big silly drinks and big silly glasses <laughs> like this. It is- How's the cell service? And this, oh, mwah, ah. it is just <laughs> absolute. You can be Instagramming. It is the most American uh, vacation spot on earth. Andrew. I got to say Rome. I got to say Rome. All of all of Western history is right there. You can turn over a rock and you've got like Catholic history. You can turn it over. You get the Roman Empire. You can turn it over. You get the Renaissance. You get the Jews great. being oppressed. The Jews being <laughs> turning it. It's part of Western, Western civilization, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go one further. Uh, Delphi in Greece. Delphi I was cool. I was once uh, by moon. There's a true story. By moonlight, broke into uh, the Oracle, hiked down the hill around the security. Uh, uh -oh. station, <laughs> came in, beautiful full moon, sat uh, at the amphitheater, had one of the most sort of transcendent experiences of my life, lifted up a rock, looked under it, and it said, Socrates was here. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin. Um, in English. I mean, I'll, take, I'll take the other half of Western civilization. So I, I still think that visiting Israel is probably the most conservative place that you can be. Not only is it a Western civilized country in an area that is not Western or civilized, uh, it is also the, the font of the Judeo-Christian morality that has shaped the West in the most profound ways. Mm. And also, it is an order of magnitude more ancient than anything else you will ever see. Oh, I mean, you, sure. you go there and it's, it is astonishing. that you, Every so often it hits you. And it's funny, I know it hit you, Jeremy, when you visited. But I remember that, you know, I'm a big history buff. And so when I was younger, I was very into Revolutionary War history. This is my thing. And so when we went to Philadelphia, I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Here's the Liberty Bell. And this stuff is like, it's so old. I mean, this stuff is from like 1776. This yeah. stuff is like, 225 years old, because it's like 2,000. It's like 225 years old, this is amazing. And then we go to Israel and it's like, okay, so take that and now multiply it by 10. <laughs> and yeah. that's, these are the stones where the Judean revolt was was fought. Right? I mean, I, I have coins in my house. I actually, I, I bought a couple of, of ancient coins. So I have a, a, a coin from the Hersanis regime, which predates Christ by several hundred years. And then I have a, a coin from the, uh, the revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, and these things are thousands of years old. And you're walking around, you're like, okay, well, what's great about it is the description of Jerusalem in all of Western literature, sort of the Axis Mundi, is the, is the central pillar of, of humanity. It's just true. When you're there, it does feel different than any place else I've ever been. I've been to Rome. It's amazing. I, it would be my second favorite spot. I mean, I, I love Italy. It is spectacular. Yeah. I've been to France. I've been to Britain. Britain is a wonderful place. You go to you go to Israel. There's a different feel to everything there. It's almost it's like there's a different spiritual dimension to just being there. Yeah. And then you're walking through a valley where David slew Goliath. I mean, it's an actual place. Yeah. You're like this. You know, the civilization we stand on the top. I mean, this is the theme of my book, but I, it really it, it, it's moving to me. We stand on top. When you see a skyscraper in New York, when you see a when you see a car driving down the street, that is stand. All of that is happening atop the iceberg. And if you just keep digging down to the bottom of the iceberg, to the seabed, that's where Jerusalem is. And so we can talk as much as we want about all the beautiful things that we've built up here at the top of the iceberg. But the fact is, if you keep melting away and chipping away at the bottom of that iceberg, that stuff ain't going to stand. It's just not going to stand. And you don't realize that until you actually study your civilization, whether it is in Greece or whether it's in Rome. Uh, or whether it's or whether it's in Israel, which I think is the place where where it runs the deepest. I'm just so pleased to have heard Ben acknowledge the historicity of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, <laughs> I, I missed that. Huh? <laughs> Alicia, another question for us. Please. All right, Christian wants to know: Should he get married at 18, even if he has to live on ends meet and work a minimum wage job, if it oh. will result, I'm sorry, result in long-term happiness down the road? Yes. By show of hands. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I say yes, but I didn't do it. I mean, did you guys no, I didn't get married it. at 18? I, I, got married. Wait, I assume I, I would have met the girl. Though. You get married, you get married young, and then that's the that is the foundation of your of your adulthood, rather right. than it being the capstone of it. That's mm. you begin right. there, right. and then you go through that journey and having nothing and that struggle with your with your spouse, and then you bond over that. I think that the problem is when you have people that uh, you know they they have their own life and then they go get married, and so you have a lot of these issues where. Uh, now you're trying to merge these two separate existences, I will, whereas instead of forging one existence together. I will tell you, I married the girl that I was dating at 18. <laughs> I am one of these weird stories where the whole culture told us, split up, you just it's insane, to, especially I'm from New York, it's insane, you should, could never get married that young, you gotta split up, go to college, whatever. And I, and I ended up fighting that culture 
for years and ended up marrying the girl I, I dated at 18. I, I, if I had it to do over, I would have done it years and years and years earlier. I, and I have to say, having been married longer probably than all you guys put together, uh, that you become a, a true partnership in a way that is mystical. I mean, it is just after a while, you are just, you know, you start out with all these things like you're talking about. You have to merge these two lives. And after a while, you're one life. And that's a, an incredibly beautiful it's thing. So true. It was funny the other day. I was talking to my wife about something, and I can't remember what it was. And I said, you remember when this happened to me? I said, no, that happened to me. Ah, this is just something yes, that you end yes, up doing yes. with your spouse all the time, oh, where no. your memories become your spouse's memories. Yeah. Like you actually, it, 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 you become two halves of one whole. And right. that's, it is one of the great tragedies of the West that people are getting married at 28 and not getting married at 21. It's food. It, it is absolute that's, stupidity. How, I mean, how old was everybody when they got married? Yeah, so, I was about to say, Drew, how old were you? Well, now, when, I, when we moved in together, I was, I was about 21. Uh, but we got married years later, but we lived together before that. So. How, how long did you live together? Four, four years. Four years? Yeah. Michael, how old 27, I guess, 28, something Matt? like that. Uh, I, was, uh, I was 25 years old Yeah, we got married. 24. 24. I was the oldest at 30. Okay, yeah, that's old. I win again, guys. <laughs> you do. Listen, there are consequences to getting married old. You know, yep. I, uh, uh, higher likelihood of divorce, for one. Higher likelihood of divorce. Married, uh, your, your options for marriage do change. Right, the the nature of the foundations of your marriage is gonna is going to necessarily be different, and there are biological consequences to getting married older as well. Um, that's not to say that people should be completely foolish. Although I do, I do generally say that any Christian uh, young man can marry any Christian young woman, and it can be and it will work if they believe in the institution of marriage itself. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the preferred way. Uh, of going about this, although it, it, it actually did work for many thousands of years. And I say Christian, uh, I really mean people who share well, you, a you're foundational right, you're right, you're right. You're right can, that, that commitment to the institution of marriage is actually more important than the soulmate idea of marriage. So there's That's a really right. interesting thread today from the National Foundation for Marriage, I think is what it's called, about what, marriages are now lasting longer. So we've actually reversed the trend. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the reasons that is suggested is that the 1980s and 90s version of what marriage was supposed to be, the soulmate version of marriage, which ended so poorly because people thought soulmate means madly in love, passionate about yeah. each other in just the way that I was the first six months of the marriage, which is not true for anyone. Love changes, it transmutes, sure, it becomes deeper, it becomes more profound in many ways, but it's not quite as like, I can't wait to be with the person every single second of every single day, the way that it is when you're first dating somebody, for example. That model completely failed. And it's been, it's been replaced by what they call the all-factor view of marriage, which is commitment to, to common goals, common values, the institution itself. That's, that's the good stuff. And it used to be, I mean, the, the separation of sex from marriage has had dire ramifications for our society yeah, in an incredibly the, serious way. The other problem with the soulmate thing is that if you say, well, I'm looking for my soulmate, someone was destined in the stars, you know, we were meant to be together. Well, okay, well then what happens when you marry someone you thought was your soulmate and then, uh, and then that feeling dies, and then, oh, you meet the secretary at work, and you say, oh, no, she was my soulmate. Yeah, yeah I, I got this wrong. And, yeah. Okay, so I gotta leave my wife and go to her. Uh, no, it's, 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 you know, the person becomes your soulmate. This is what the sacrament of marriage is in Christianity, anyway. The person becomes your soulmate, literally, in a metaphysical sense, when you marry them. It's, they weren't your soulmate before yeah, that, right. but in that moment of bestowing that sacrament onto each other, uh, now you're locked. And that's why Christianity, it's supposed to be that you, you, can't, you literally cannot separate. And, and th this is, that is such a good point because I've asked people, before I got married, I said, what's the secret to a long marriage to people who have done it? And they gave a lot of advice, patience, all this sort of thing. And don't get divorced is what people told <laughs> yeah. me. Don't get divorced. And it is, in the traditional Christian view, divorce is not permissible. And so if you go in and you say, look, we better, if there's a little tiff, we better work this out because... Do, Divorce is not going to happen, so you better work it out. There is a real sense of security and comfort there. You say, you, you are, by mm -hmm. definition, my soulmate, and so I, we're going to be together. I, I discovered this backwards because I was not committed to the institution of marriage or to anything when I got married. I was too young and too nuts, you know, and I, I think that what I was committed to, I was madly in love with my wife, as I am to this very day. And slowly I began to notice that there was a third thing that bound us together, and it was really this marriage kind of purified all our own kind of shambolic mm. flaws and tendencies yeah. and, and was actually better than either of us alone. And so I kind of discovered the institution of marriage by providence. And, and it really is a, it's a real thing. It's a real yeah. thing. And if you commit to it, I think that you're, you're in solid because also it's a kids, beautiful way to live. 
kids too. I mean, that, that's what, you know, kids are the, the, this, the kids need the security of knowing that both parents are, are you know, are, are devoted to this marriage. And I can remember when I was a kid and all of my friends, all their parents were getting divorced. And I talked to my mom one night and I was very upset. And I said, my, all my friends are getting divorced. What if that happens to you and dad? And she looked at me and she said, we will never get divorced, period. It will never happen. And, uh, and I believed her, and it was, but I needed to know that, that mm -hmm. they both felt that way, that no matter what happens, it, that, that is just not an option, it's not on the table. And for me, as a child, I, I needed that assurance, and there's a lot of kids growing up who don't have that security, and I think it wreaks havoc on I, their... You know, when I see people, and I know a lot of them who have left their wives, mostly I know guys who have left their wives, with children, small children behind, and they always say to me, and I, and I know women who say this too, they always say, the kids will be fine, the kids will adapt. And I thought, yeah, you blew up their planet. You blew their planet up. They're floating in space. They'll never be all right. They will never, ever be all right. And I think that that, it, it's such a travesty to, for a momentary You have thing. that story of the person who, uh, who got the divorce and their their child became an adult. It was many years later. Their child's 18, 19 years old. I'll, I'll ruin this It was, it was ten, 10 years later, ten and years the child later. went off the rails and went so badly off the rails, they finally had to do that thing where they virtually kidnapped the kid and, and take them to a psychiatrist. And they all sat down with the psychiatrist, and the first words out of her mouth were, why did you get divorced? And, and the mother said, that was 10 years ago. And it's like, yeah, you blow up somebody's planet, it sticks, you know, they remember. I mean, Jesus had a lot to say about this, and I always, it always makes me laugh when they cast gay people out of the church, but then they have a divorce workshop. You know, they think like, yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> Marriage is one of the few issues. Divorce is one of the few issues, one of the few sort of hot button societal issues that Jesus spoke about very directly. That's right. And he, because on a lot of, you know, he's spoken parables and sometimes it's very frustrating that you're trying to decipher, well, what does that mean? On marriage, though, he said, no, you can't get divorced. Yeah. Can't do it. If you do that, you're an adulterer. Uh, if you remarry, then you're making that person an adulterer. He's, that's, that's right there. It's in all the Gospels. Yep. And yet Christians still find a way to, Look, yeah, yeah, he said we, that, but... We, uh, and, and we worked hard, you know, we worked hard to keep the marriage going. And, I mean, in, in the Old Testament, there's a, a very bizarre section that's very hard to understand about a husband who accuses his wife of being an adulteress. And so they're supposed to go to the Kohen Gadol, they're supposed to go to the priest, and he is supposed to make her drink this kind of magic potion where he dissolves the name of God, and then he makes her drink it. And then if she's an adulteress, then she dies, essentially. And if she's not an adulteress, then she lives, and they have to get married, they have to stay married. And it's, it's very puzzling, it's very weird. It's called the Sota section uh, of the Bible. This is in Numbers, right? Uh, yes, and, and, it's, and it's really strange, and people don't really understand it. The purpose of, of that, whole, that whole situation, the purpose of that illustration, is that it is forbidden in the Ten Commandments to take God's name in vain. Right? God is very serious about you not destroying his name. In, in Jewish law, if there is a scroll, any piece of parchment, any piece of paper, where you write God's name out, this is why Orthodox, many Orthodox Jews won't write, even in English, the word God. They'll do G-D because they don't actually want to throw it in the trash. You actually have to take the scroll, you have to go bury it somewhere. That's how seriously we take the name of God. Uh, you're not allowed to pronounce uh, what we call yud k vav -K. You're not even allowed to spell it with the letters. That would be Jehovah in the, in the English transliteration. But um, in Latin. It, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's with a Y. But, it's a, but, it, it, but the, the purpose there is that God considers the institution of marriage so serious that he is more willing to have his own name trampled and dissolved mm -hmm. than to allow a marriage to dissolve for bad reasons. Wow. Right? That's, that's the message there. Yeah. I, I would say, too, because there are a lot of divorced people. I'm married to someone uh, for whom our marriage is not their first. And it is true that Jesus says that if you, you know, the, the New Testament holds that if you remarry, you make of your spouse an adulterer. Uh, Jesus also says that if you lust, you're an adulterer, not, not you're on the path to adultery, sure. not you're kind of like an adulterer. I mean, really, if you think about it, if Jesus wasn't smoking pot, and they're like, oh, it is kind of like that. <laughs> no, he's, Jesus made a lot of very absolute statements about the nature of morality so that people would understand the absolute nature uh, of their uh, state and depravity. And one of the things that bothers me, you'll, you'll hear evangelicals of a certain stripe sometimes say, oh, you married a divorced person. Well, you, you know that in God's eyes, uh, they're still married to their first spouse. And I'm like, what, when did God become an idiot? Like, that's, that is obviously not true. And if it were true, imagine what the morality of it would be over time. So let's say you got married when you were 18, you got divorced when you were 22, you got remarried when you were 30, you had four kids, now you're uh, pushing 50, and some evangelical gets a hold of you and says, well, you know, in God's eyes, you're still married to your first spouse. 
and you go, well, holy crap, I don't want to disappoint God. So you walk away from the four kids and you walk away from the current husband and you go find, I guess, some person that you used to know 20 years ago and see if maybe they also believe that you're still married. And you knock on their door and you're like, hey, we're still married. And they're like, what the? God's not dumb. God, uh, God uh, doesn't function outside of reality, right? God isn't the hypothetical God. God is the God who is. And uh, while divorce is a terrible, terrible thing, uh, is, is absolutely a destruction of the great analogy, according to Paul, that God gave us for our relationship with him, is our relationship between husband and wife uh, in marriage, as in all things. Uh, God's a God of grace as well, and a God who functions within reality, a God who actually does know what we are. I'm not saying that if you remarry, you don't make of your spouse an adulterer. I, I'm saying that the actual takeaway from the teachings of Christ is supposed to be, I'm an adulterer, not how could I possibly I, I, not be an adulterer? I, no, I agree with this because what Jesus says is, is Moses gave you a law by which you could get divorced because he knew your hearts. He knew, <laughs> he knew, he knew basically. Yeah, Jews, but from okay the beginning, the, divorce is a, is a thing in Judaism. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. I mean, we are anti-divorce, no, but it's a possibility. And I, and I think, I, I think you're absolutely right. We're not supposed to live in this savage way where people get stuck in a, in a I, know, I know a lot of people who got divorced like minutes after they got married, like, a, you know, within yeah, months, yeah. and then got a very happy second marriage. I, I definitely think that's a very different thing, but it's a, it really is a serious business to tear apart what, what God has brought to No, no question, yeah. I'm not making any defense yeah. of divorce. Yeah. That's, that's why I think, you know, the Catholic Church, we have the concept of annulment, uh, which is, the idea there is, it's also not like you're going to get stuck on a technicality because God's not going to do that. So just because you, you said the words, it's not like God is saying, well, you're stuck. Um, so, but there's an investigation to find right. out if you So can, you, can you, know, you, could, you could have a, a situation where you get married and you get divorced right away. It's obviously mm. uh, you weren't serious about the vows. And in that case, then it wasn't, the marriage just never occurred. Or, you know, you go to Las Vegas or something and get married when you're drunk. You, you drink a giant, uh, one of these <laughs> right. full of booze. Anyone right. get married. But there's also no married. question that I, I would assume in the Catholic view that that is innately connected to, because when you're talking about annulment, you're talking about sexual activity also. That's innately connected to the possibility of bearing children. I mean, the, the real shift that has happened in Western culture is the disconnection of marriage from childbearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it used to be that the, I mean, a plurality of people who got married, the woman was pregnant when they got married. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was in the, as, as late as the 1930s and 1940s. A huge number of people. The majority. The, it, was it the majority? It was, it was, either, the, it was either the plurality the or the people. majority. A huge percentage of people we're having eight, we're having seven month babies, mm. right? Because people were not, but the, the expectation was, you know, you, 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 you do the crime, you do the time. I mean, yeah. That's, yeah. That, that, because it's not about you. It's not about you. If marriage is about you, then you ought not mm. get married. Really, and this is true with your spouse, it's true with your children, it's true with your God. Like the, if, if marriage is about you finding a way to personally satisfy yourself, then don't get married. Because honestly, marriage isn't gonna do that for you. Marriage is not about personal satisfaction. Yeah. Per, marriage is about you becoming a better human being. That's what marriage does for you. The same way that that's what religion is supposed to do for you. That's why when people look at religion like, oh, well, I'm personally satisfied. I'm spiritually satisfied. My I don't give a crap. And you know what? God really doesn't either because God has a bunch of things you are supposed to do that he expects of you and that are duties. Your spiritual fulfillment is last on his list. Yeah, because, Job, Job wasn't particularly spiritually satisfied. <laughs> by the way, you, I mean, you know Jesus better than I do, but it doesn't look like if he were a human, it would have been a particularly satisfying life. Right, and yeah. if you look at and if you look at Moses, Moses has a pretty miserable life, yeah. and Moses gets crapped on by fate one million times, and then dies right before he enters the land of Israel. So he never even gets to achieve his lifelong dream. He doesn't even get to pass on the leadership to his son. God says, "Pass it on to Joshua." You don't get to pass it on to your own kids. That's right. These are people who live. I mean, David fights civil wars with his own children. These are people who live hard, terrible, difficult lives. Because God is the God of reality. This but, is but, right. But he's also. I have to inject this. I hate to do it, but he's also the God of joy. And all of the things you're talking about actually are a great joy. It may be at a different level than picking up a girl in a you know in a bar and going home with her, which can be a, a pleasure. But the, the but the joy marriage, is you. But the joy is in, truly, is in you reshifting your mind to meet him, not him reshifting reality well, to meet it. you. But that's it. He he's, he rewards you for that with joy. And I think even people like Moses, like Jesus, who live this these lives. Of, of great tragedy and great difficulty, there is some kind of transcendent feeling when when you have met your God that is mm. well, it's, it talks about Moses' face shining so it's strongly he has to put on a mask yeah. when he comes off of Mount Sinai yeah. because the idea is that when you have aligned, I mean, this is the natural law of you in Catholicism, when you've aligned yourself with, the, with nature's God, when you've aligned yourself with the God who created you, created the cosmos, created this entire system, 
then that's what's supposed to give you purpose. That's what's supposed to give you meaning. And when you disconnect all that stuff and then you demand of reality, that reality change to fit you, no, then you are, de you, you, are, you, are, you are declaring war on the only thing that can make you happy. Because God is the God of reality. And, yeah, and yeah. When, you, when you love him, you, suddenly reality makes a whole bunch of sense. You know, I, I always, it always gets me when somebody says, you know, uh, you know, my wife died in a plane crash and now I've lost my faith. And I thought, why didn't you lose your faith when somebody else's wife died in a plane crash? Because <laughs> yeah, that right. is the world, you know? Yeah, I think, I think one of the great messages of the Bible, Old and New Testament, is uh, to find joy through suffering rather than yeah, that, in, yeah. in modern times we find joy, we try to find it by getting around suffering uh, and you just, it's just not out there. You've got to go through it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that takes patience and... Well, this is why the, the entire question when people say, well, well, how can you rectify the idea of a good God with, human, with suffering in the real world? Is because God's idea of good is not your idea of good. You are not God. And this whole idea where God is supposed to conform to your idea of what's right and good, you don't even know as much as the, as the basic conglomeration of humanity that sets the price of a pencil. Yeah, that's Why do you think that you know as much as God? By the way, you're not, God is God, you're not God, is almost the entirety of the gospel. I mean, like, <laughs> I, I'm always trying to think what's the simple, how can yeah. you get the gospel down to its simplest form? Well, the, the way that that's I always put it is God is not a gumball machine. That's and people right. who expect God to be a gumball machine, you know, if I do X, Y, and Z, then I will get X. Yeah. Or then why isn't this gumball machine working for me? I, you know, I don't really want to put in the quarter, I'd rather put in the dime and get the gumball. Too bad, man. Yeah. That's not how this works. So if you are 18 and you are contemplating uh, getting married. I do have a patented piece of marriage advice. I, I have several. One is two bathrooms and a king size bed. <laughs> I promise you can't go wrong, but you may say, but Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy, I can't afford uh, a king size bed or I can't afford, eh, get married anyway. But this is real, this is really good advice. Uh, and no one will tell you this. Go to bed angry. This is my, this is my great marriage advice. It's not great marriage advice day to day. People will tell you never go to bed angry. And that's fine advice. If you lose the never. What they should say is do everything you can not to go to bed angry. But in the final analysis, sometimes when you try to navigate mm. life with another human being who is in every way different than you, where you can't even agree on the things that you think you agree about, uh, because you're actually using the same words to mean different things, you won't figure it out for 10 more years. <laughs> uh, when you're in that situation, you do occasionally mm. come to moments that you simply cannot resolve in the moment. Mm. And you're in a fit, you, you sit in that moment of complete desperation you do not have, know how to reconcile yourself to your spouse. And the best thing you can do in that moment, go to bed. And what I mean is, go to bed, literally. <laughs> because you will wake up in the morning and you will still be married. The beauty of marriage is that marriage is. You don't have to, you don't have to create marriage on a daily basis. Marriage will carry you through these problems if you lean on it as an institution given to you by God. The only thing you can do is break your marriage. So. If you reach the moment of, of sort of irreconcilable conflict, stop trying to reconcile it and just lean into the reality of your marriage. Lean into the fact that tomorrow you will still be married as long as you don't do anything stupid like stop being married, which has been statistically the cause of 100% <laughs> of all divorces. I, Alicia, we have one last question for the group for the night. Final question of the night is I think a question that is on all of our viewers' minds. Michael, do you only gym tan laundry everything else on your body besides <laughs> your legs? And why are they so pale? And why is the control room showing them to me again? You, I you just, know, I'll, get, I'll give I you the real reason. I can't handle this. I'm I, so I, triggered. This is like sexual harassment. I'm over this. <laughs> I am done. She's gone. No, at least out of here. No, wait, please don't go. <laughs> <laughs> the, the real answer for this is men should not wear shorts. I am doing it for you, people, all right? I, this is the spring break edition, and you're gonna see the only part of my body that is a little more on the white side. This is the white supremacy of my body right Stop now. Stop stroking your legs. I, it's really nice, you know? But Thank really, this is the problem. Uh, Tony Soprano, I think, said it. In, in The Sopranos, he said, uh, a Don is not supposed to wear shorts. It's not a good look. It's for little boys, for grown men, not a good look. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on this, I think, rousing edition <laughs> of the Daily Wire Backstage. We want to especially thank Matt Walsh and all the people who subscribed during the broadcast today. Uh, we're going to be drawing a name tomorrow for someone to win a chance to come out here and see us. Thank you to all of our subscribers, even the ones who didn't sign up tonight. We appreciate you keeping uh, Michael Knowles uh, in giant <laughs> comedic bottles of hooch. And we look forward to seeing you back here next time. Adios. Fake laugh. Three, two. Bye. <laughs>